The game includes all these topics listed above and is a very mature rated game. Also, this game in particular has some very gruesome and horrific sound effects and imagery. And a lot of screaming and terror, like voice actors putting it all into the performance. So be warned if you are easily disturbed. So the title of this video, you should have clued into that. Incredible music, fun interesting characters, gruesome fascinating lore, and lots of corpses. And horrible brutal deaths. <coughs> yep, it's Corpse Party, my favourite kind of party. A series dear to me and probably a lot of others. I remember getting a PSV exclusively for this game and I called it my Corpse Party machine. But we are going to be deep diving into Corpse Party Blood Covered Repeated Fear. The best way to start the series. And I will be covering the entire series on this channel because it's one of my favourites. And it gets real interesting and really weird as the series goes on. Now covering this game will be a challenge because I'm going to have to be very careful with the guidelines for YouTube. Because if you look at those guidelines, you will see that almost every single one gets broken by this game in some way. So we're going to have to think of fun ways to censor stuff and I will try and be creative, don't worry. So, butter up your poopers, get drinks, get food or snacks, though that might not be the best idea honestly. And if you enjoy this video at any time, there's a like button and you can leave a comment if you want. If you are a returning viewer, welcome back. And if you're new, welcome to the channel. And let's all together fall into the world of Corpse Party Blood Covered Repeated Fear, which is actually Corpse Party 2021 on PC. <laughs> Corpse Party starts with a game trope I love. Like in Silent Hill where it was the letter from the wife, here we get a message that we won't know the context of until the end parts of the game, saying, Sachi is my pride and joy, she'd do anything for me. The rest is cut off, but a spiral of words say, I don't think she even recognises me anymore, but I still love her with all my heart. Then we get introduced to a girl with dark bluish hair telling a ghost story with a candle. She describes a teacher who died in a school that existed here before Kisaragi. The previous school was called Heavenly Host Elementary School. Which, if you name a school that, it's going to end up being haunted, or in this case, even worse. She then says after many incidents that the school was closed and the principal threw himself to his death. The teacher who died still roams the hall of Kisaragi Academy. As she is telling the story, a blackout happens and the characters all panic. <coughs> Satoshi accidentally grabs into Naomi's chest in fear 100% percent on accident. Yoshiki and Satoshi then debate about who's going to answer the mysterious knocking. Then we get control of Satoshi and answer the door. And it's the really young teacher, Miss Yui. Now, the voice acting in this game is really good. You know what, scratch that, it's incredible. The quality of voices and headphones is so crisp and clear, and it uses a technique called binaural recording, which means sound can travel from one ear to the next. It can also sound like it's behind you, in front of you, a full 3D space, and in a horror game, that's really effective. So I recommend watching this with earphones or headphones if you can. Ayumi is proud over her horror story being effective, and then we get introduced to Satoshi's sister, who came with the teacher after school for some reason. Oh yeah, because he forgot his umbrella, and he would drown without it. Naomi and Seiko find Yuka adorable. I don't, for reasons I will explain in a bit. Sorry, Yuka fans. Seiko introduces the love triangle in the game between Satoshi's childhood friend Naomi and his sister Yuka. But it's also between Seiko, who has a crush on Naomi. In fact, I'm going to explain the relationship dynamic between characters because it actually has plot relevance. I'm not even kidding here, so bear with me. Naomi has a crush on Satoshi, who also has a crush on her, in which they're both childhood friends. Sound familiar? But Seiko, who is Naomi's best friend, has a crush on Naomi, in which Ayumi and Yuka also have a crush on Satoshi, in which Yuka is actually the sister of Satoshi, so that's weird as hell. And Yoshiki has a crush on Ayumi, and Morishige and Mayu have a crush on each other. Now, this is actually information we need to know to explain some character motivations and plot points. 
The sister thing is really weird though. I don't think it's romantic. Spoiler and editing. They went the romantic route. Mai Yu's transferring to school, and it's her last day. So Ayumi decides to trust a random ever after spirit chat she read online. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? So beforehand, they take one last class photo with Mayu. Then they do the Sachiko Ever After, with a paper doll representing Sachiko. Again, a charm that Ayumi found on the internet. The idea is that once the charm is done, your spirit will be connected with whoever did it forever. In a way, it's not entirely wrong. So everyone gathers in a circle around the paper doll and repeats the words, Sachiko, we beg of you. Nine times. Let me repeat that point again, nine times. Conveniently, there were nine people. So it actually works by just saying how many people are doing it. Then you grab hold of the doll and each person rips it apart and keeps their peace with them. <laughs> Make sure you don't lose it. Surprisingly, nothing bad happens and the friends are connected forever. Okay, randomly an earthquake happens and the classroom opens up into a dark hole and everyone falls in. See, this is why you don't trust stuff from random Tumblr blogs or websites. Damn it! We wake up and Naomi feels like she has sprained her ankle, so not a good start. And we are in Heavenly Host, one of my favorite designed horror locations ever. A ruined Japanese elementary school, and there's nothing more scary than school. We explore a bit, and thankfully, we find Seiko. Exiting the classroom, you can hear just how good the sound effects are in this game. We find a rusty bucket, and this bucket is super, super important to the plot, trust me. So Naomi is already injured, so foreshadowing, if anything chases her, she ain't gonna make it. We also find a note on the ground reporting the third student that is missing in a kidnapping case. Remembering Seiko, we go back and check, and she's still breathing. Both girls have no idea where they are, and Seiko attempts to break open the windows, which is smart, that's what I would try doing. It doesn't work though. They do notice that the desks are small and deduce that they are in an elementary school. My dear Watson. Seiko reads the printout on the wall and they discover they are in Heavenly Host Elementary School. Like the one in the story. Seiko has a calm reaction to this news. They then decide they're going to try and find a way out, as you know, you do. In high spirits, they set out to explore the school and find their friends. And then, that Corpse Party Chapter 1 theme starts playing, and like all music in the game, it's a banger. But I still think PSP has the best version of the theme. Now before the game continues, we get a full introduction to the characters and their backstory and character trait. Playing as a floating eye, we inspect the characters and first up is Satoshi Mochita. 17 years old, called fairly average, ouch, but he is very popular and he's kind and cowardly which means he's probably not going to make it. Though he's also a natural leader so that's good to have. Then we learn his weakness is Naomi who challenges his leadership. Then next up is Naomi Nakashima, who is one year younger at 16 and teases Satoshi with a special greeting. Very useful information to have. Her father died when she was young and her and her mother depend on each other. She's also experienced in nursing and wants to join a medical school, so very useful in this situation to have. Then we have Seiko Shinohara, a 16 year old who is very close friends with Naomi, a free spirit so unpredictable, can be good in a horror scenario or bad for us, we don't know yet. Her mother left her and her dad when she was young and she took over her mother role, so she's going to have good traits and knowledge. She also speaks to Naomi about the dreams they have for the future, yeah. Then we have Yuka Moshida, a 14 year old who acts younger on purpose, so that's annoying and not helpful. She's also spoiled, acts as a princess, gets her way and never lost her childlike behaviour. And then apparently wants to act older, so in short, she's useless, probably going to die, and a massive liability. We will get into dangerous situations. Then we have Sakutaro Morishige, a 16 year old, a theater kid, so he's weird, and is close with Mayu, unsociable, which in Heavenly Host might be a good thing. The ex violently if anyone makes fun of his name, now that's not good at all, but it's not a Yuka. 
And then next up is Mayu Zumoto, another 16 year old, is smaller than she actually is, which makes no sense, possesses a big heart and a bright personality, accepts anyone and everyone, so in short she's useless in this scenario. Then we have the reason we are in this mess, Ayumi Shinozaki, that's a fun last name to say, Yoshiki agrees. Shinozaki. Oi. She is a 17 year old and loves to tell ghost stories and make people scream so the worst possible thing to have in this situation. She does carry candles though so that's useful. However she is also more cowardly than Satoshi so <laughs> not looking good for her. And she completely shuts down in scary situations, well shit. Then we have Yoshiki Kishinuma, a 17 year old sarcastic and cynical but also honest. He's the best person to have. Then we have Miss Yui Shishido, a 23 year old English teacher. Wow, that's young. That's younger than me. That's weird to think about now. She has a good connection with the students. Well, I'm sure that will be helpful. So overall, from our cast of characters, we're pretty much screwed and will most likely either panic or probably kill each other. Such is the life of high schoolers. What I like most about the characters in Corpse Party is that they behave like actual high schoolers. They're not exactly superheroes. They could be selfish. They can make dumb decisions. They aren't overpowered, which some people might say, oh, the characters don't have much to do, but in a sense, they are trapped in a cursed school and are like 16 to 17 at most, so what do you expect? Anyway, back into chapter one, we get control of Naomi and Seiko. Seiko then notices her limping. We then take a look into the shelves and it's covered with black hair. Inspecting the notice, we find out there's been a kidnapping and students should be cautious. An earthquake happens, which to me signifies a change of the layout or dimension of the school. As when they leave the hallway, it's now very different than before. Inside the bucket is now a yellow fluid, which is most likely pee, so if any character needs to pee for instance, you know, this bucket is probably going to be used for that. More notices on the wall tell us to examine everything that seems odd. These wall notices can add like a tutorial but are also in universe to the characters and also later can be dangerous or even taunting. One thing I gotta mention again is the art style, it's perfection, dare I say the best horror pixel art I've ever seen. Can you imagine if they decided, you know, let's make this 3D and cheapy instead, that sure wouldn't work. We try opening a door but we get told that it won't move, like a decoration, which is really creepy to think about. Can you imagine trying a door or a window and it looks real but doesn't move or open? You can't break the glass? It's just so unnatural. Out of the window we get described a forest that never ends, a rare part of Heavenly Host that you actually don't see that much in the games. And it's the forest, with lots of corpses, naturally. At the bottom of the classroom we get a loose board and place it down like a bridge over the hole below us. A lot of the school is falling apart and has a lot of holes and you really don't want to fall down them. In the stairwell we find a lit candle. Nomi remembers seeing this candle which from a certain character's bio we might get a hint where this is from. This also acts as the save points in the game. At the front door Seiko comments on the tiny shoes and this is a pretty common horror trope. In fact Coast Party manages to probably hit every horror trope imaginable. This one being called shoes left behind trope, which signifies that something ominous or catastrophic has occurred, leading to the sudden and unexplained disappearance of people, leaving behind only their shoes. It's a visual cue used to create a sense of mystery, unease and foreboding, as it implies that something dreadful happened so quickly or violently that people didn't even have time to take their shoes with them. In this case, it's also to show it's an elementary school. Trying the front door, unsurprisingly, it doesn't open. Not exactly a decoration, it just doesn't open. Naomi already starts to have the seed of doubt of never escaping take root. Well, Seiko, she's still in high spirits. Picking up the loose board and placing it upwards, we get more progression. The stairwell though has been blocked off by chairs, so we can't go any higher. We hear a sound of a man's voice saying, Please wait. For Seiko, she apparently doesn't hear it. Entering classroom 2A, they find human remains in the classroom. Like I mentioned in Silent Hill 2, the art style changes to show a glimpse of the more realistic style compared to the pixel. A really effective horror technique in gaming that I do enjoy a lot. Naomi confirms the bones are real. Then the spirit of the boy who died appears as a blue light and explains to them how Heavenly Host works. We learn that we are trapped and were taken here against our will. And what here is, well, 
a cursed multi-dimensional nexus, multiple planes of existence, all piled on top of one another, created by powerful, vengeful spirits. Do not worry, I will explain this in a bit if it sounds like a ton of buzzwords. The dimensions are referred to as closed spaces. The spirit senses other people have been brought here at the same time. The spirit also reveals that Naomi and Seiko cannot meet them since they are in a different closed space. The only way to do this is to find a way to enter their space or find a way to bring them into this one. However, we are still reminded that escape is impossible. But at least we can all die together, so that's nice. The spirit then gives us some wisdom before getting scared by the ghost in the red dress. <laughs> The chalkboard starts writing itself and they leave the room. Now, for your convenience and my entertainment, I have made what I call the Cold Party Dimension Explainer. Since all we have there are words to explain everything, this will be able to show you how Heavenly Host works. I'll be coming back to it frequently during the video each chapter and each dimension switch. So let's start. In chapter 1, as you can see in the top right, obviously we have all the characters in Kisaragi Academy, and this square represents the school and the living world, I will say. This big red circle or eye represents the Nirvana. No, not the band, but that's what the curse is called. We learn more about it in future games, so right now it doesn't matter too much, but all you need to know is that the curse is the form of Heavenly Host. And inside the curse are multiple closed spaces of Heavenly Host. The same, but different. The layout can be different, different things could be happening, but most importantly, there's different people trapped in each one. Now, the only thing at this point in the game that can move around these closed spaces are the ghosts, which we will learn about. The spirits blue are people who died, but while sad, still try to help the living. Red are the vengeful spirits of people who died in this school, with unresolved emotions such as anger and bitterness. And of course, the corpses. So if you die in one of the closed spaces, the closed spaces kind of merge after death sometimes and appear in another closed space. So you can just find a corpse that didn't die in a closed space appear in another one randomly. Multiple closed spaces in the game though are recognized by the difference in color of wood, flooring. Now I've brightened the images of each one to make it more obvious, and in-game this is represented by grey, purple, light blue, and red. I'll move the characters we know of so that we can keep track of which characters in which closed space. So for chapter 1 we only know about Seiko and Naomi, so they are currently in this closed space, the greyish floor one. Also before we get back to the chapter, time doesn't exactly work the same in Heavenly Host. What may seem like hours or days will only be minutes passing in the living world. There's also time loops going on and there is no day-night cycle, so two different closed spaces, they're not really past or future, just present. Which also makes events non-linear, so you might see the aftermath of a tragic event, while a character might see the warnings of a tragic event. But it's not a future event, it's an event that's already happened. It's confusing, but time basically doesn't work, even though some closed spaces may be older than the others. Back to the story, Seiko and Naomi just encountered their first spirit, Pikachu. We go back into the classroom, inspect the bones, and hear the spirit begging for help. We also inspect the ID name tags, and these act as collectibles. The corpses are the collectibles of the game. We find out their names, their class, their age, and most fun, how they died. In Heavenly Host, there are so many ways to die. You can die from traps, you can die from getting killed by a weapon, you can die from drinking the tap water, which could be acid or poison, you don't know. The floor might change and crush you, your friend might betray you and kill you, you might decide death is better, you might find another person and they murder you. Oh yeah, vengeful ghosts with weapons might torture and kill you, so for morbid curiosity we can find out how every corpse was killed, it's fun. Oh, and I forgot to mention the suffering and pain you feel when you die here, well, death ain't an escape, the victim will feel that the pain of how they died for eternity, so make sure if you're gonna die in Heavenly Host, you find a less painful way. And don't fall down a floor, that's such a lame way to die. We inspect the shelves again, and the hair is literally moving. And in another one, dead bugs, so that's grim. Inspecting the shelf again, we see a creepy ghost face. Spooky. We inspect the chalk drawing, and it's a person holding a pair of scissors chasing four smaller people. Or shadowy. Or maybe just something in my eye. The notice post in this room has, I'm going to kill you 
written in cursed letters, which may or may not be blood. In the corridor, the notice mentions, admit it, you hate your friends, eventually, you'll kill each other. Which I've only noticed now has a creepy face of a girl, which is probably a vengeful spirit, and it kind of looks like Sachiko. We don't know for sure who wrote these though, possibly a malevolent spirit of the school or even the curse itself manifesting the messages. Either way, it adds to the creepy and hopeless atmosphere the game excels at. Then walking further down, we hear the horrible sounds of flies and for this game audio, it sounds like they are burrowing into our ears and we find the source of the flies, a smashed up body of flesh that splattered under the wall. Or as Seiko says it, Someone was thrown at superhuman speed. Seiko describes it in way too much detail, which causes Naomi to almost puke. Then we find another loose board and more creepy notes on the wall. Then we find another blue spirit telling us we should pay attention to the warnings left behind of the dead, which is pretty misleading. One of the dead's notes mentions them seeing a black shadow which eventually killed all their friends. We will meet this shadow shortly. Entering one of the classrooms, there was a purple glowing object, but when we go around, it's moved. A helpful blue spirit tells us we should pay attention to where the object is before it moves. So we leave Seiko on the other end and then enter back and she picks it up when it moves. We now have the infirmary key. Before heading there though, we inspect a corpse in a note and it tells us someone's documented information about Heavenly Host. The person writing it died when they bled out from the tendons on their ankle getting cut. All the windows, doors and walls are removable and you can't break them. Which is actually sort of a lie, it's kind of just random when you can or can't. She does clarify that anything that doesn't lead outside can be damaged or opened or whatever. They then finish describing their pain, which is tragic because when you die, you feel the pain of your death for eternity. Man, does this place suck. Then the older sister starts going crazy. Curiously, the red door has something that sounds like TV static playing. But we can't enter, so we move on. We place the loose board and gain access to a higher floor. As we go up the stairway though, we get a glimpse of a bloody ghost boy following us. The note beside us is hard to read, but it actually says, do not read the victim's memoirs to their conclusion. And this floor is the school toilet. Going into the boys, we try all the doors and like all horror game bathrooms, they have jump scares or scary sounds. In the last star, we get shouted at to shut the goddamn door, which Fair enough if someone was using it. We aren't exactly meant to be in the boys' bathroom anyway since Naomi and Seiko are girls, so you know, that's just the rules. Another bucket outside, this one having meat and maggots, yum. Inside the girls' toilets, one of the doors doesn't open for some reason. Leaving, Seiko starts asking Naomi for the ass medicine and then says butter up my what? Huh? <laughs> So Seiko butters up her pooper, and are we sure this is a horror game? And she's very excited about that. Seiko is what we call a gremlin. Yay! Leaving Seiko in the bathroom alone, Naomi hears Yuka crying for her big brother. Now, Yuka isn't in the same closed space, so this is an example of events or echoes passing through the spaces. Going back to check on Seiko, she was actually in the locked bathroom stall. Oh, yeah. Which is strange. Unfortunately, going down the stairs, Naomi trips in a plank and further hurts her ankle. Thankfully not falling down all the stairs though. Going into a stairwell, we get lore about what happens when you die here. The spirit then moans in pain. It didn't turn red, so fair play, and it drops an unknown key. We 
We try the key on classroom 3A and we can now enter in which we get the choice if we actually want to. Seiko is still obsessed with all forms of booty. Choice in this game actually do matter in a sense. So it doesn't continue the story and just leads to a game over or what is called a wrong end. This is another collectible in a sense. Getting all the wrong ends and at the end of each chapter, I'll go through them all. We enter the classroom and inspecting the body, we see a message scratched into the floor with fingernails saying, whatever you do, don't look at the newspaper. So with this obvious warning, what do we do? We look at that damn newspaper because curiosity never killed anyone. The newspaper is Heavenly Post, a news article about the kidnapping in the school. Now it ends in a murder. The newspaper goes into grisly detail about the state of the bodies and the murder being a male instructor, catatonic, holding a pair of scissors. Seiko remembers hearing about the murders, though it was long before any of them were born. When we try to leave, the door has become a decoration. Well, shit. I guess we shouldn't have looked at that newspaper, huh? Checking it again, though, it now says we will never leave this room. Sounds like this is how that other person who told us not to look at the newspaper died, trapped in the room. Inspecting that body, it starts crying. This is a very sad game when you think about it. Actually, you don't even think about it. It's a very sad game. Catchy music, though. Eventually, though, the lights turn back on and they unlock. I guess the school didn't want to repeat the same death. I see you spirits getting creative now. Now exiting, Seiko has lost her paper doll scrap since she didn't listen and put it in her ID. And just put it in her pocket. I'm trying to think of where she dropped it and it's not revealed, but I'm going to guess the bathroom stall when she was... Thematically, that just makes the most sense. Walking back through the bloody mess of a person, Seiko steps in the gut. Then we head to the infirmary, and the note here is a tutorial on saving. With candles, but it also drops a little bit of lore about if one fate is overwritten, it may never be remade. Coast Party deals a lot with the theme of fate, but it's really Book of Shadows that that's explored, which is technically the sequel, but not really. Inside the infirmary, we find a box of matches in a space heater. I mean, that just sounds incredibly useful. The diorama on the wall has someone who has painted over the organs with actual blood. They must get really bored with just killing people here, so they start doing stupid stuff like this. The desk with the journal is more like those museum props you can't touch and they don't seem to be readable. Wanting to rest her leg, Naomi lies down on the bed. Seiko then makes a makeshift splint and bandages. That, that's actually really resourceful. It might come from her having to take on the mother role. Seiko then plays shipper in the dimension of death and suffering and decides to bring up the topic of Moshida, or Satoshi, the average dude who everyone has a crush on. Seiko tells Naomi she should confess, and after joking around a bit, she considers it. Which, unknown to Naomi, Seiko has a crush on her. So Seiko really just wants Naomi to be happy, putting Naomi's happiness above her own. Then Seiko starts going in perv mode about Naomi's ass, and it's at this point you realize that Seiko really likes asses or booty or poopers. It's nice to have a moment of peace and joking around, because we will never get this moment again. <laughs> Naomi then once again hears Yuka crying, a sound we will all be getting accustomed to. Seiko this time also hears it. She then goes to investigate and insists we stay behind, which is an awful idea. Naomi strangely out of all moments thinks back to when Satoshi grabbed her chest. And then she just wants to see him. Sadly though, we're gonna see someone else. Getting up, Naomi tries the door, but it's locked. Because everything locks in this place. We then hear Sachiko's laugh and an older woman. The door to the exit has now been covered up in thick black hair. Then the lights go off and the diary starts writing by itself. Going up to it, throws us back. 
And then that black shadow, that dead person's note, appears. We get a look at it in non-pixel art and we can see it resembles a human and has purple glowing eyes. It now chases us around and creates red demonic holes in the ground and that blocks us from moving. So Naomi uses some quick thinking and uses the matches we picked up on the hair. However, it wasn't strong enough, so we need to find a way to make this flame stronger. Thankfully though, we find rubbing alcohol on the shelf beside the sink. We bait out the shadow and then set the hair on fire, escaping the infirmary. Naomi then finally vomits. I say that as if it's a good thing. Then Seiko comes running to her. She fortunately couldn't find Yuka and confirms my dimension explainer is correct. Naomi then tells Seiko about the shadow and she tries putting on a cheery attitude. Again, Naomi is starting to crack, as you would. Seiko's just too good for this world, literally. Naomi has now come to the conclusion that there is nowhere else to explore. That's a scary thought. The isolation and trapped feeling of, well, there is no more hope anymore. You checked everywhere. You were stuck. And there was no way forward. It's like when you get exam results. All you can see is dead people warning you, messages taunting you, and now you were just attacked by a shadow. There's some real psychological horror going on right now, and when you remember that they are just high school teenagers, even more messed up. So Naomi feeling this way isn't exactly abnormal. We do hear her inner thoughts though, realizing she is being childish. Seiko still tries to act cheerful and optimistic, but Naomi is giving into despair. Though she is realizing she doesn't want to say this stuff, but for some reason, she can't stop herself. Which results in her getting into an argument over Seiko being just so happy. そろしい目にあって心がとうと折れてしまった。聖子を元気づけようと思ってた私が気づいたら傷つけてた。辛くて悲しくて子供が席を切ったように酷い言葉を叩きつける私の心の解放感をそれと Seiko then drops the act a bit and gives a motivational speech about loss and death and moving on. These themes sure show up a lot in games. Seiko is now speaking about her mother, and we see that Seiko may look like she's holding up fine, but she's also feeling the effects of Heavenly Host. Naomi, though, is under the effect of something different. So her anger here is sadly not exactly her fault, which results in quite possibly the worst suggestion ever to split up, which makes Seiko angry and her cheerful act truly drops. We get the choice to apologize, which, da, who isn't going to choose that? She doesn't fully get the apology out, though, but Seiko understands. But she still thinks Naomi wants to split up. They go their separate ways, and Naomi gives us a chilling voiceover. この異空間に拉致された者の中でもまだ幸運だったはずの同じ次元に存在することができた私たち二人は簡単に喧嘩別れをしてしまったこの些細な私の意地張りが大きな後悔を招くことになるのは
その後すぐのことだった We play a Seiko for a bit here and find a corpse that fell through the floor, lamest way to die. Seiko then heads back up since they have explored most of the school. Splitting up was really pointless. But an earthquake happens and we can't enter back into the infirmary. And the earthquake has now broken the path to the bloody mess. And when Seiko's alone, she doesn't do well without Naomi. And she starts to panic. Seiko feels they're going to die here, so she wants to confess her feelings. However, she talks herself out of it since she knows about Naomi's crush on Sadashi. Finding a note on the wall, we read it and it triggers a flashback to Seiko's childhood about Seiko's mum leaving. On the first floor, Seiko hears a voice, but the player doesn't get to hear it. We get the choice of following the voice, though there is no option to progress. You must follow the voice. <laughs> We go back to playing as Naomi and hear about her struggling with being alone. She describes not being in control as if an alien was in her head and that she kept calling Seiko's name over and over again. This might be the voice that Seiko heard. Naomi though doesn't have any memory of what she was actually doing during this time. Walking past the door we hear one of the bathroom stalls close. Entering in, we see shoes and banging against the stall. The stall that was locked when we tried it earlier. So we open the door and it shows the realistic imagery, so I'm gonna have to censor it. A bloody wall and Seiko hanging from a noose in the stall. Her eyes popping out and drool and tears running down her face. I had the same reaction as Naomi here when I first played. Seiko, though, isn't dead yet, and tries calling out Naomi's name. We try tugging at the new spit, it only strangles her more. However, there was a bucket outside with all maggots, so we can put that under her feet maybe, give her some support. Returning back to save Seiko, Naomi drops the bucket because, sadly, we were too late. With her eyes rolled to the back of her skull, Seiko is dead. And so ends chapter one. Well, that was a rough start. There was no way to save Seiko, sadly. No option can save her, no matter how much you want to. Well, time to update the Dimension Explainer, because Seiko has died. And her spirit now suffers. Well, shit. So she's not in the closed space anymore and joins the curse. Before moving on to the next chapter, though, we gotta talk about the wrong choices or the wrong ends I mentioned. But you can lose by making the wrong choices and see the infamous wrong end screen. And technically, they're all canon in a way. So let's go through the ones in chapter one quickly. If we don't look at the newspaper, this will lead to a wrong end. But before that, if we fail to escape the shadow, well, Naomi dies and the shadow starts choking Naomi and draining her life by suffocating her. And the last image Naomi sees is a creepy, smiling face of a woman. Then we get the wrong end screen with a bloody hand. The PS Vita one actually looked a lot better, I'm not gonna lie though. The wrong ends are game overs, you have to reload from a save and the true ends are the only ones you can do to progress. The next wrong end happens if you don't read that newspaper, so sometimes you ignore the advice that seems helpful, a bit unfair, and I don't know why this leads to a wrong end at the end of the chapter, but hey ho, corpse party, here we go. But when Seiko is hanged, three ghost children surround Naomi, they freeze Naomi in place, then they force her to hold sewing scissors in her hand. And they make her try to swallow the scissors, which is really horrific and the sound effects really don't hold back. Warning again, they make these sound effects way too realistic. Last thing we hear is a child's laughter. <laughs> then, last wrong end happens if you read all the victim's memoirs. Remember that information that was torn up that they warned us to not do? Well, this one you really don't want to do. The note starts with a love letter and becomes increasingly more disturbing as it goes on, with the final one describing how you want to kill the person by ripping out intestines to make flowers bloom. 
this insanity was eaten away by the score when something called the Darkening took over. I'll explain the Darkening in detail later on. After reading the last one, we find Seiko in that chair that used to have a corpse. Seiko's mind was broken hearing about the story and she goes insane or is possessed. Four days later, or I guess we Seiko. guess there's four days later, Seiko starts speaking again, saying Naomi's name. But then she reverts back to saying, poor girl, before laughing crazily. <laughs> so, while this is a wrong end, to be fair, Seiko's still alive. She is insane, but they are together, so technically it's a better ending than the true end. I guess they would both eventually be insane, but you know, at least they're not dead. Chapter 2 starts with a Naomi Seiko flashback to them in the school gym, with Seiko once again drooling over booty. Naomi is a beautiful Going into way too much detail, this devil gremlin creature flashback ends with Seiko implying stuff, and we get brought back to reality. Seiko dead in front of us, swaying back and forth. We now take control of the teacher, Miss Yui, or the text box says Miss Shishido, hearing Naomi's scream, similar to how they heard Yuka's. Entering the classroom, we find Ayumi having a panic attack and Yoshiki looking after her. They all heard Naomi's scream. Miss Yui then splits up with Yoshiki offering to look in her place, but since she is the teacher, she wants to keep them all safe as a priority. She's a good caring teacher. Yoshiki certainly isn't the best at being comforting. So now back to the Corpse Party Dimension Explainer and we have some new updates. Naomi is now the only living person in her closed space since Seiko's dead, so that's kind of sad. But this new closed space with the purple floor, we have Miss Yui, Yoshiki, and Ayumi. So that's a lot in one space. Better than Naomi and Seiko, who only had each other as the only living people, really not even other humans. They did have a lot of corpses and spirits though. And now it's just Naomi, alone. Back to the chapter, Miss Yui is shaking with fear. We find the bucket with fluid again. Instead of the plank of wood, we get a purple crystal power stone, which protects the user from harm. We get the option of keeping the stone or giving it to Ayumi. We give it over. We aren't allowed on the third floor because, well, we're a teacher. On the ground is a key to classroom 3A, a pretty cursed classroom as we remember. We unlock the classroom door and we head inside. And are immediately greeted by a blue spirit so a helpful one. This spirit though seems quite aggressive, referencing the other two back in classroom 1A, so all spirits, like on the Dimension Explainer, can see people at all times. The spirit then explains the closed spaces to her about multiple dimensions overlapping, you know, the gist. However, it also tells us we can hear the screams sometimes since it's the same dimension, but we can't do anything about it. The spirit also says your body or spirit can move from one space to another only when you're dead. This spirit really explains all the lore, well, even going in on about how time and space are fragmented with Naomi's scream being in the past or even the future, but not this dimension's future. Time is really messed up. We also learn that we can influence the closed space in very small ways depending on what we do, like, you know, a plank of wood being set down by Naomi. Miss Yui inspects the shelves and they have kitchen knives and all sort of cutting sharp tools. Trying to exit, a red spirit appears and pushes Miss Yui back into the shelf with the sharp tools and they all fall on her. <laughs> then the spirit goes on a rant about school teachers. 
Spirit then says he will kill the other students. Miss Yui, in her last bit of strength, says to spare them. So, that happened. And if we find a vacuum here, I'm sucking up that spirit and pissing on that bag. Returning back to Yoshiki and Ayumi, we now play as them with Ayumi wanting to search for Miss Yui after the earthquake. And we get to exploring a new version of the school from chapter 1. We find a note saying if we find name tags from the corpses, please bring them to me, the custodian. What's interesting is the custodian is a character who is called a different name and doesn't have the ability to read or write, so... This is just telling you about the collectibles being name tags, really. And the shelf, we get a lovely picture of kids stabbing an adult with kitchen knives. In one of the classrooms, the door is once again like a model. Feeling the cold, Shinozaki decides to light one of her candles, which, if you can't tell by now, are the save points. So all the lit candles are actually Ayumi doing it and placing them from one of the closed spaces, and it's affecting the others. さっき階段の時に使ったろうそくあるだろう。持って。それつけてちょっと休もうぜ。少しは暖かいだろう。わかった。On the bottom floor, we get the scariest creepy music in the game. It makes you feel so anxious. It's really effective and might be the most unsettling song in a game for me. And we will hear it most of the chapters, so enjoy. One of the notes in the entranceway mentions how the area randomly changes behind you. Walking up, we see a horrible sight. Four corpses all together. Ayumi starts having a panic attack, which, you know, makes sense, especially when the first corpses you see are, well, a corpse party. Oh, yeah. Inspecting the corpses, we hear one of them say the name Kizami. But I'm sure that name means nothing and we'll never hear that again. All the corpses here have an ID, and they also tell you what school they're from. And all these corpses are from the Yakudan, not the toy. A way too much detail moment about the whitening of bones, and we get the ID. And they offered the flesh as food. Wow! We start reading the victim's memoirs, because that was always a good idea. Two people decided instead of starving that they would play rock, paper, scissors, and loser ate the winner. Then we get a description of what eating their friend was like, so... Yeah, when I said this was the most gruesome horror game in the title, for once I wasn't lying. And they also decided to keep one of her eyeballs, for some reason, like sick any stuff here. Such a nice pixel art looking game, somehow the horror is more effective not being shown, but being left to our grisly imaginations. And detailed descriptions. That might be why Cope's party is just so special. Entering a room, Ayumi starts having a headache and saying we shouldn't be here. And Ayumi was right, because at the end of the hall is a bloody ghost child. <laughs> Ayumi seems to have some knowledge about ghosts though and tells us to not look into his eyes at any cost. So we avoid looking and pick up a rusty nail puller. Walking back, Ayumi is acting strange. Okay, really strange. She then pushes past Yoshiki and runs to the front of the building. <laughs> we find her in the corner and her eyes are wide and she's muttering nonsense. 
娘の誕生日なのに7つになったお祝いに。The character who actually possessed her is the one from the infirmary, who we will later find out the identity of. Yoshiki then says the coolest sounding phrase ever. Shinozaki. Oi. And Ayumi acts normal again. Looks like Ayumi wasn't aware when she was being possessed. Or shadowing. Leaving, the ghost child ambushes us. So we run back in, run past it, back into the stairwell. We go back to the starting classroom and use the nail puller on the fixed door. This is a very useful item to have in this place. And it broke. Rip. Once again, though, don't read the victim's memoirs to completion. Even though they have some juicy details, like the cannibal talking to their friend's eyeball. We press the control mechanism lever, lever. How do you say it? In British English, in the UK, this is said as lever, lever. I guess I'm a lever then. Sorry, Ayumi. We run back past the ghost and find another one of the levers. Activating it actually makes a bridge to a new part of the school. Well, for them, it's just the stairwell to the infirmary. The ghost, though, appears and decides to try killing us again. We bait him out, though, and go up the stairwell. Ayumi decides to place down another candle, which in turn was what we actually used in the first chapter. But again, time ain't working right. So it's not like they're in the past, just small things can impact the closed spaces. In the infirmary, a note describes how to remove a tongue, which goes into graphic detail again. We find another set of bones on the stairs and once again hear the name Kazami, but I'm sure it's not important. Kizami. The victim's memoirs describe them getting so hungry they ate the eyeball. Checking the mirrors, Ayumi looks kinda strange. She very easily gets possessed, it seems. Yoshiki comes to a hilarious thought process after seeing Ayumi grinning and somehow made it about himself. We once again find the same shouting ghost in the bathroom stall, like twice in one game. We got jump scared by a toilet door. Ayumi and Yoshiki then find the shadowy remains of a figure in the girl's toilet where Naomi was. Ayumi having strong ties to the spiritual world can tell that someone has died here and, well, she doesn't really take it well. <laughs> now what she is saying here is actually another character's dialogue. Outside, she then once again gets possessed by the shadow infirmary spirit. And we hear some dialogue from very far into the past. Ayumi has been completely possessed now and is laughing like a mad woman. Opening the stall that Seiko died in, it's completely black. A shadowy remain of death. That's what happens when dimensions overlap each other. Yoshiki makes a silent plea to protect Ayumi from everything instead of letting his doubts and fears win. Ayumi starts muttering more stuff like, Why the hell are you doing this? Foreshadowing. Yoshiki then hugs onto Ayumi, which breaks the possession, but Ayumi punches him. Ayumi then speaks about how the stain is someone they know, and the mind is filled with pain and agony of dying because Seiko was also possessed in Ayumi, accidentally, in that room. Yeah, it's getting really dark, like, darker than it already is, if that's even possible. And will it get more dark as the story goes on? Yes, it very much will. She pretty much relived Seiko's thoughts while dying and the tortured soul she now is, describing the pain of her throat. <laughs> いや、切るようにあつくて。好きもしてて。枕で。動いても手も足も<笑> 
man, is it rough to hear about Seiko's experience while dying. I didn't notice this until we playing. It was just describing Seiko. Heading back the way, we see a ghost girl for a second before going into the infirmary. And Mayu is sitting with the ghost children. So, back to the dimension explainer, it looks like Mayu is also in this closed space. It's a lot in one space. Mayu is speaking with the children very calmly and just talking about school and stuff. But she does tear up when seeing us. <laughs> Mayu can also tell that these kids have been through some awful experiences. And we read more from Heavenly Post, the follow-up report, in which they got their tongues cut out, majority of head removed, and more gory details, but the bottom half of the note is missing. Meaning these ghosts are the ones who were kidnapped and killed long ago. The ghosts then levitate Mayu, but we can't do anything, so we have to leave her. <laughs> Ayumi has a nosebleed, which might be because of all the possession. They then go down the corridor and we see a girl with, as Yoshiki puts it, eyes like a dead fish, which I'm going to have to look up and, oh damn, that's kind of accurate. Something I want to point out though is that on these screens we really see how dark in terms of light Heavenly Host is. The corridors are shrouded in it, with only moonlight being the source of light. It really puts into perspective what accidentally finding a corpse and seeing stuff in this place would be like. Back to Fish Lady though, she actually starts speaking to us and straight up reveals that she died here a while ago. Which is interesting because she's appearing in this form while normally it's a blue spirit. But what's even stranger is Ayumi recognizes her and knows her name. Naho. That's a fun one to say. And she is famous for speaking with spirits and a website with info on paranormal studies and occult stuff. So this should be helpful. And then Ayumi says she goes on her website all the time and her last post was on the Sachiko Ever After charm. So Naho is the one who wrote about the charm, the one that got everyone stuck in here. The one that leads to all the death and suffering? Because Ayumi trusted the stupid paranormal website. Yoshiki picks up that Naho seems to have came here on purpose. But she won't tell us any information about that and sneakily changes the topic to Mayu needing help. Huh? She does however tell us more about how to possibly escape and about how the closed spaces are the form of Heavenly Host due to the sorrow and agony of its victims. Its tortured souls, you could say. However, in particular, the victims of the kidnapping incident that we keep hearing about 30 years ago. <laughs> Naho, though dead, thinks the key to escaping is to appease those poor children. Since they are the cogs that keep the closed spaces together, the way to do that is to give them closure, and she also reveals the murderer of them is still in the school somewhere. Exploring around the school, we find the severed head of a doll. What, you think I was going to talk about a corpse? It speaks for us to return it to its body. We do find the doll's body though, and the doll starts speaking.
They think the doll belonged to the murderer, but Ayumi also thinks it might just be telling us what we want it to say. Returning to Mayu, they hold up the doll for them to hear it. The child ghost cries for their mother, but it doesn't work, and the ghosts drag Mayu out of the room. And right into the wall at superhuman speed. Ooh, well, this explains the chapter one pile of guts. So back to the dimension explainer, and we now have an update as Mayu is now not in this closed space. Well, technically she is, just on the wall, but she's also dead, so yeah. We're losing a lot of the cast right now. Back to the chapter, and that certainly did not work. Shinozaki runs away in fear, and Yoshiki starts to lose it, staring at the meat of their friend. But before he can think anymore, a red-eyed zombie man appears behind him and says, Stop hammer time, and hits him in the back of the head with a sledgehammer. Well, this is somehow the true end of the chapter, so Yoshiki gets dragged away, but we do catch up with Miss Yui, who's getting crushed by a cupboard. And the red spirit has mercy on her, and raises it back up. And Miss Yui really cares about her school children. Never underestimate a teacher. Miss Yui then heads back, not knowing how long time has passed. And so ends chapter 2. But before that, we gotta go over the wrong endings of this chapter, which are somehow worse than the true ending of the chapter. One of the wrong ends is staring into the ghost boy's eyes. He freezes Yoshiki and we can see he has no tongue. Yoshiki wakes up and starts suffocating because he's been buried alive. The other wrong end happens if we don't chase after Ayumi and go activate the lever. See, Heavenly Host also has traps like wires, and Yoshiki activated the wire, and Ayumi kind of walks into the razor sharp wire. Then going back, yeah, the pixel graphics really went far with this one. That's a very detailed corpse. Weirdly, the actual image isn't as graphic, but Yoshiki accidentally cut Ayumi in half. And he also accidentally walks into the wire as well. <laughs> What's cool is the power stone actually stops a wrong end from happening, and we hear Miss Yui's voice depending on what was going to happen. <laughs> Leaving Ayumi while possessed, Yoshiki goes into the stairwell and has a flashback of when he first met Ayumi. <laughs> Yoshiki was smoking in a stall, and the gym teacher catches him and basically rips into personal details about his life, being disowned by his parents, being a loner, not showing up to class. Yoshiki is coming to the opinion of just leaving the school and also beating up the gym teacher. Ayumi though interrupts and tells the gym teacher another person is looking for him. Ayumi also can read minds. She then gives a heartfelt speech and starts crying because of it. It's a nice speech and all, but... Possessed Ayumi appears behind and pushes Yoshiki down the stairs, quoting Seiko as Yoshiki gets killed.
Then the text describes how he died in detail, which doesn't exactly happen too much for other characters, so I don't know why Yoshiki always gets the worst ones. <laughs> then we get the worst wrong end of the chapter, which is really saying something. Reading the final memoir, the person who ate their friend comes to the conclusion there is no hope, and they started eating their friend's corpse again. And Yoshiki wakes up and Ayumi is dead beside him, with Yoshiki spitting out blood and meat. He then picks up a note by Ayumi and it describes someone chasing her, wanting to eat her. And that person was Yoshiki. So he repeated what he learned in the notes, which then cursed him. So lesson learned, don't read the damn notes. Chapter 3 starts introducing us to new characters from a different school. Mitsuki crying about a person with a sledgehammer. We might have an idea of who that is. And my favourite name in the series, Fuck You Roy. I don't care if that's not how you pronounce it, that's how I'm saying it. It's actually Fuck a Roy. <laughs> they mentioned seeing their friend Emmy die, head being split open by a hammer. But they also mentioned how the corridor has grown in length. Unfortunately for them, someone screams at them and runs at them. And we get screen flashes of them getting repeatedly hit by a hammer, so damn it, fuck you, Roy died. Mitsuki though managed to get away and she actually makes it outside because Heavenly Host has a walkway to another part of the school. Mitsuki though sees the headless ghost and it starts chasing her. A group of people are really just getting constantly chased by ghosts, huh? We then only hear Mitsuki scream and then a phone call and we are back to seeing what's happening with Naomi. It seems a spirit is calling her phone asking for help, which then transitions into Naomi's mum panicking at her daughter being missing. But no matter what Naomi says, it can't be heard through the phone. Naomi is still at Seiko's corpse, wondering why she would kill herself. Then Naho starts speaking to Naomi, telling her Seiko was most likely afflicted by the curse, and to prevent it, took her life, as many others before her have also done. It's really just a lot of ways to die in Heavenly Host. Naho also tells Naomi she is the only living person in this closed space, and doesn't exactly give the most comfort in words. Naomi then runs into the worst luck, tripping down the stairs, hurting her leg again, then vomiting, but she also hears Seiko telling her to pull herself together. She then breaks down, calling for her mum and then Satoshi. It's here you reminded the age of the characters being teenagers. So begins chapter 3, and right away we are playing as Satoshi, in a blue floored place, with Yuka shit. So back to the Dimension Explainer, and we now have the status of most of the characters. Satoshi and Yuka currently are in the blue clothes space with Seiko and Mayu dead, and Yoshiki, Yumi, and Miss Yui in purple, but Yoshiki's state is currently unknown, and Naomi is in the grey floor space, alone. Yuka is already acting annoying, considering the fact she's older than she acts, which is infuriating. This blue spirit though is really nice, and does reveal a bit about the school having a mind of its own, since it's all one big curse. <laughs> Going outside, we find the bucket, but this time, it's empty. Foreshadowing. We once again do the leave one person to catch the purple object move puzzle, and unfortunately the game doesn't just let us leave Yuka behind. <laughs> They find their first corpse and learn about the danger of the school. 
reading a letter scratched into the floorboards it says kill me please kill me repeatedly the id says they killed themselves when discovering little sister's remains foreshadowing <laughs> then we find the sister who died of dehydration he has to act like he's not scared to keep yuka sane He also wants to find Naomi, thinking she might be scared as well, and yeah, he ain't wrong there. Another helpful note tells us once again, do not stare at ghost children since your souls get eaten, and the ghost children also hold the building together. Staring at the ghost child, he starts making his walk towards him, but Yuka's scented beads actually break the concentration and let Satoshi escape. If you decided to take them. Exploring more, we find an object on the ground, an unknown key. Cause that has always led us to good stuff. Yuka needs to go to the toilet, well do I have a bucket for you. But since we're in the floor with the toilets, we let her go in alone. Yuka couldn't go, so we go in and see why, and we find out that the bathroom stalls have no floor to get to them. The unknown key actually unlocks the infirmary again, and going in, we hear Naomi's voice. <laughs> We then get to see what happened to Yoshiki, and he's actually alive. Ghost children laugh around him though, and the hammer dude comes back and is about to hit him again. But before we can see what happens, we once again read the heavenly post about the murder case, but this time the bottom has some notes. Then we hear Shinozaki scream and run outside to find Mayu's blood from where she was dragged across the floor. Before investigating, we get another rusted nail puller. Going to where Mayu's body should be, there's nothing there but the black stain of her body. So no bloody mess this time. With the nail puller, we remove the nails to the girl's toilet. Inside, once again, we are told not to read the victim's memoirs. Which I kinda got by now. They're really just there to get wrong endings since with the amount of warnings most people not wanting to lose probably won't read them. Inspecting the urinals, they are covered in blood, so we can't use them. I mean, we could just still use them, but it's fine. So we have to look somewhere else for Yuka to pee and hear a camera snap sound and a flash. Following it, we find Moshige looking at his phone with a face of pure joy. I always knew theater kids were weird. And the darkness reveals to show that Moshige is beside Mayu's remains, which have now appeared in this closed space. And Moshige goes into way too much detail about the remains. Not knowing it's Mayu's, obviously. Then Moshige is looking for Mayu. She's in front of him. Then he suggests to split up, which... No. Never. Has no one learned anything from all these corpses. So they split up, and Yuka for once actually brings up something to note, that Moshige was taking a picture of a corpse. Going back down the corridor has increased, similar to the chapter opening, so hopefully a madman with a hammer doesn't come running down at us. The body at the end of the corridor mentions some names out loud in their spirit voice, which means we might see those characters at some point. I don't know. Going back to the classroom, we can actually read the message that Yoshiki and Ayumi left. For Miss Yui. Another thing that crossed over in the closed space. We used the nail puller to smash the glass in a cabinet and get a small key. And the nail puller broke again. Going back to the new corridor, we use the key and enter the outside walkway where it's constantly raining. They debate climbing the fence, but all that's outside is just woods that never seem to end. We enter a new part of Heavenly Host, the second wing, and the air is thicker here, which gives them both headaches. Exploring this building, we hear a piano play, but the room is closed. But then when we start to leave, it mysteriously opens. Going in, someone is really failing at playing the piano. Touching the piano though, the music suddenly stops, but it continues once we exit the room. On the top floor, there's green skull ooze that hurts us if we step on it. We find a note talking about the closing of the school due to repeated tragic incidents, and because of it, the school will be closed in 1975 and then get demolished. Trying to enter the boys' toilets once again, the stalls aren't accessible. It's like the school's playing a trick on us or something. 
I mean, that's exactly what's happening. Entering the cursed art room, and I've got to say, no other room has been described as cursed, but this one. So this room's got to be really bad. It's also pitch black until lightning flashes and there's a living girl in the corner and a really creepy red painting. Walking up to the girl, she doesn't say anything or move, it's like she's frozen in time. The only thing she is doing is opening and closing her mouth rapidly. Interacting with her more, she seems to be speaking about baby chicks, but the way she is speaking and the topics sounds like she's also possessed by the infirmary shadow person. Talking about Sachiko's kind gesture. Leaving, we meet another living character, Mitsuki, but she keeps running, still scared from what she saw. But she's traumatized and just keeps screaming random words and running away. <laughs> the girl's bathroom has all these spiritual blocking charms on it, so we can't use that one, and we really shouldn't. So they decide Yuka should pee outside. Honestly, after finding the first corpse, they really shouldn't have been that bothered about finding a toilet in a dangerous place where you could just pee anywhere. Or maybe the buck. Satoshi then describes it being Ichi or a genius, depending on your point of view, and sends Yuka alone. It's at this point you're like, okay, Yuka, I get you act younger. But in this horror situation, maybe don't try and act younger for once. Yuka's about to climb over, but before she can, the ghost girl comes running up to her. <laughs> so we run away, obviously, because who knows what will happen if the ghost catches up and we'll find out later. Entering back into the building, well, Satoshi is gone, so... Who couldn't have seen that one coming? We find Moshige over a corpse again, and Moshige remembers we are Moshida's sister. Moshige offers to help Yuka, but she's creeped out by his behavior around corpses, because he's really weird around corpses. He starts walking towards us, and if he catches us, he just says, why are you running really creepily? Inspecting the corpse, it's Mitsuki. And she was very recently killed, considering we literally saw her two minutes ago. <laughs> Running away then entering a door, we bump into someone that you can mistake for Satoshi. It's actually a charming fellow called Yuya Kizami. Never heard that name before. Kizami. From Byakudan High School. Thank you Kizami for actually being smart and saying the living should stick together. He does say join the hunt though, which is, you know, strange wording. Now we actually play as Kazami and we are strong enough to lift over the knocked over shelf. We get a loose floorboard from the shelf and lifting another shelf in the cursed art room, we get warned about the green goo and out of all odds, a spiritualist was here. We left behind shoes blessed with holy water. I mean, what are the odds? Going into the art room, that girl from earlier has faded away from the curse. The curse really just does whatever it wants to people. Walking safely across the goo, we find a crystal of unsealing. How much spiritual stuff was left behind here? The purpose of this crystal is so you can go to the bathroom, I'm not kidding. Somehow she just won't piss anywhere in this rotten place. We break all the seals and enter the bathroom, while Yuka's in the bathroom, a boy enters the door who knows Kazami. He is called Kurosaki. We find out Mitsuki found out her boyfriend was cheating on her with three other women and now she's dead. So that's a shitty week. Kurosaki thinks it was the ghost children who killed her, but as he says this, he gets stabbed by Kazami. Who then Spartan kicks Kurosaki down the hall so Yuka can't see. Now that they mention it, I do remember a lot of the dead bodies with spirits saying Kizami's name, so yeah, this might explain some stuff. Kizami! Kazami then basically says, you're dead anyway, it doesn't matter who kills you, him or the ghosts. So not only do we have to deal with curses, darkening, hunger, thirst, people going mad, eternal torture, no escape, 
murderous ghost children, vengeful spirits, a zombie man with a sledgehammer. But now we also have a psychopathic serial killer stuck in here. Well, that's just fab, innit? Exploring a bit, it seems we're in a room with no escape. We find records of students and schools, and a blood-stained cassette on the floor. We also find a note called Strange But True Stories of the Occult. Sounds like a good YouTube title. And we get told some lore voiced out. From this we learn many things, but most importantly, one child survived in a red dress, a ghost that we had seen at the start of the game. Then Naho starts speaking to us somehow being able to determine Satoshi's worry for another's well-being. She reveals a massive twist though that we actually performed the Sachiko Ever After charm wrong because someone chanted too many times or too little. Naho is quite manipulative here suggesting someone did it on purpose trying to turn Satoshi against his friends. And in her twisted words, she also reveals it's important to keep a hold of the scrap of the paper doll, which we know Seiko lost. Then Naho starts chanting a charm which Satoshi describes as burning to go to the one who occupies his thoughts. But he probably won't be able to save them on time, but who will? <laughs> but will Satoshi make it in time? Well, we find out next chapter. But first we got some wrong ends to go through in. These ones, well, you will see. The first wrong end happens if we don't take the scented beads from Yuka at the start, when the ghost starts forcing Satoshi to walk. Satoshi walks off the edge and falls down, dying from his wounds, when he slams into the floor below. He then looks up and in his dying moments sees Yuka jumping in after him. The next wrong end happens if we don't escape the ghost. You know, when I said Yoshiki gets his death described the worst, I was lying. Yuka's is crazy. Like really game. The sound of a foreign object scraping against her cranium echoes through her mind mercilessly, that's a word, mercilessly. Not from her eardrums, but directly into her brain. Could you not have just said she got her eye taken out by scissors and died with the screaming and the scissor sound? Okay, it keeps going. It's all the suffering of the world coalesced into a single moment. Okay, I don't hate Yuka that much. They make you feel so bad for getting the wrong ending here. Oh, and it doesn't end here. The pain grows exponentially worse with each heartbeat. Yet the trauma of the experience makes the heartbeat faster. Okay, you could definitely has the worst ones. Like, just give me the game over by now, please. Oh, it's still going on. It's not something you can adapt to. It's not something you can ignore. Why is this sounding like an Avenged Sevenfold song? All you can do is thank heaven above when you finally die. Is it finally over? Re really, most of the sounds. I guess this means Yuka is dead and the ghost is not satisfied so we'll go cut out other people's eyes. Well, that was descriptive. Yeah, don't get caught by the ghost as Yuka. We can obviously get one from just dying on the green goo. It's not worth showing though because it just ends. And finally, one for reading the victim's memoirs. If you didn't know, you weren't meant to read them. Wish they warned you about that. Satoshi just reads the note and has despair. There's no image. Fades to black and tells you Satoshi succumbed to the curse of the school and stood in a corner. Then his mind and sense of self gets destroyed and they describe the message having a curse that basically deleted him. They all f forward Satoshi from the game. So yeah, not really interesting. You just read a note and it cursed and it killed him erasing his mind. It does help explain what happens to some people who get taken over by the darkening. And it really does vary each person, which is what happened to the girl in the art room. Chapter 
Chapter 4 opens with the flashback of Seiko washing her younger brother and they are both without clothes, censored by bubbles so I ain't showing anything here. Then we get to see what Mayu was doing, so I guess they want to show us a bit more of the dead characters before they died. We see a flashback of Mayu's mother and she looks very tired. It's clear she didn't want to transfer schools and the mother is upset with the father putting work over them. None of this matters though because Mayu is in Heavenly Host now and dead. Mayu appeared in Heavenly Host alone so that was something that really did lead to her death quicker. Though something really weird here is somehow Mayu lost her charm when she just arrived. Maybe it was in her hand and just fell into the curse. Mayu instantly sees the two ghosts which is also very unlucky and she decides to go introduce herself and we know what happens because of that. We wake up as Satoshi now and wait a minute, is that a grey floor? To the dimension explainer. Okay, we got some updates now. So Naomi and Satoshi are now in the same closed space, meaning man chose the crush over the annoying sister. I don't really blame him. Miss Yui is still in purple, so is Yoshiki. Wait, that's kind of, he's kind of unknown. He was just hitting the head with a hammer. Damn, that happens a lot in the chapters, huh? Ayumi is still in purple and Moshige is in blue and Seiko and Mayu are dead. Back to chapter 4 and Satoshi is the first person to have been sent to a different closed space. Exploring around and getting that nostalgia from the first chapter. We actually find a note mentioning how someone tries drinking the tap water, or I would call it trap water, which apparently burnt him and killed him. It also says they attempted to drink rainwater. I really wonder if that would have worked. We also find Seiko's cell phone weirdly down here of all places. Though this is where she followed the voice. When walking near the bathroom, Satoshi hears Seiko's voice tell him to take care of Naomi. She's on the verge of snapping. Naomi, she then finds Naomi in the stairwell. As he goes closer, she disappears as if he was just seen an after image. Her cell phone does fall from the stair though, ringing. We pick up the cell phone, then head to the bathrooms, where we hear a conversation between Naomi and Seiko, with Seiko teasing Naomi. Naomi, what's that? Jealousy? Trying the stalls, they don't open, so we try leaving. Then we hear Naomi choking. Kicking open the door, Naomi is hanging herself. We have options here how to help her, with the correct ones being to hoist her up and then reach behind, since all other options will kill her. Sadoshi manages to loosen the noose. Satoshi. And after hugging, Saroshi and Naomi explained the last thing she remembered, which was falling down the stairs. Satoshi then asks about Seiko and Naomi shows him her corpse. They take her corpse down and place it outside. Naomi thinks Seiko killed herself after the fight they had but Satoshi reveals that Naomi was also hanging herself without realizing it. So the same thing could have happened to Seiko. Satoshi then realizes that he is in a different closed space since the air is very different. Seems Naho sent Satoshi to this one. Naomi then loses consciousness and Satoshi takes her to the infirmary, which is also her place of trauma and he leaves her in the place, so... Yeah! He also remembers he has a sister to help and we go back down and the hallway isn't there anymore. Then cuts to a flashback of Kurosaki and Kazami, with Kazami about to kill Kurosaki's hamster. Kizumi's sister Haruna stops him, but he said he had a younger sister. Huh? 
あんたねそういうことばっかり言ってると本当に救いようのないクズ人間になっちゃうわよバカ And Kizumi hates being the youngest. And how he always wanted a little sister. Yuka comes running out, and Kizumi enters, and she still can't use the toilet because all the stalls are handing corpses. We can see why this one had all those seals now. The cuss must be really strong in this bathroom. Kizumi is more fascinated in the compact girl's mirror and imagining how the owner's face would have looked before she died. You can't open any of the doors, the corpses prevent it. Weirdly, one of the causes of death is attacked from behind, so that could kind of mean anything, no? The other ID fits better with hanged by someone else. Foreshadowing. Kizumi seems to take pleasure in the idea that so many died in this one room. A lot of pleasure. <laughs> Now he calls Yuka his little sister. He can have her, honestly. We now finally get to see what's happening with Ayumi, and apparently she was in her version of the other school building, but she got a headache. Entering back to the main building, she hears a ghost girl laughing. <laughs> Then Sachiko, the ghost in the red dress, appears, the survivor of the incident. She makes a phone page sound when she runs away. Ayumi says she looks lonelier. <laughs> Entering the infirmary, she is surprised to find her candle there and thinks someone moved it. We then find a newspaper and read it. The newspaper goes through the history of Heavenly Host and about how popular the principal was, with his popularity leading to a building expansion. It was all going well until the murder incident. Ayumi then senses her spirit on the bed, but she doesn't approach it and picks up the antique doll. She won't go near Mayu's body, so we can't go that way. Strangely, on the first floor, the doll starts crying. One of the bodies we find is headless and describes that their friend went into the woods outside and never came back. And for three whole days, the ghosts were chasing them. Not gonna lie here, the main cast have got a pretty good compared to the victims who are being hunted every single second by the ghosts. It seems depending on what ghost you get hunted by, the way they kill you is different. And it fits the way the ghosts were murdered. Even weirder though, the body was killed recently. More of the closed space is time not working with random bodies appearing and seemingly more people entering Heavenly Host. Ayumi actually walks into broken glass and she cuts her hand on it and then she finds out She's anemic, which means her body doesn't produce enough red blood cells, so losing blood is really not good for her. All the notes now are just pure hopelessness, speaking about how there's no escape, and it would be fun to join them. And think of interesting ways to die, very morbid stuff. We enter classroom 2A and Naho is there. Ayumi confronts her about the repentance and how it really didn't solve anything and got Mayu killed. <laughs> Then Yoshiki alive, but with a head wound, enters saying he heard a voice. Yoshiki explains the important question. How is he even alive? <sighs> Which is for some reason, he lost consciousness and woke up in the first floor hallway. Ayumi just mentions someone possibly carried him there. Naho then says if we appease each child, the closed spaces will close into one, reuniting everyone alive. Naho says the murderer was the man with the hammer and that the doll we have was his given by his mother. Which apparently keeps his mind level. Yoshiki talking about Naho's mentor causes her tone to change. 
She then reverts back to telling us to find his remains, which should be somewhere. Then starts freaking out, it's like the curse has taken over her. Possibly darkening, since she blames Mayu's death on us. Ayumi comes to the conclusion that the doll crying could be a tracking device to the actual body. Yoshiki then says that Yoshikazu had a bad aim with his hammer. I personally don't think he was trying to kill him though since he seems to have pretty good aim with everyone else. In the stairwell, one of the gaps is now closed up. Exiting, the doll starts weeping and now speaking, telling us from red door, six steps horse, 13 paces rooster. Now like most people you wonder what the actual hell does that mean and on my first playthrough I remember just spamming interact everywhere. So 6 south and 13 steps west and we find one of the floorboard. Now to actually solve this whole puzzle, there was actually a book in the classroom we read that I had to write down to remember called Circumventing the Ancient World. With rat being north, we count round like a clock with the animals so rat 12, ox 1, tiger 2, rabbit 3, dragon 4, snake 5, horse 6, Ram 7, Monkey 8, Rooster 9, Dog 10, Pig 11, and then back to Rat 12. We're also looking at the directions north, east, south, west with the clock hands. So pretty complicated stuff for a puzzle, especially when you have to inspect a really plain looking shelf to find the book. Back to the floorboard, we find a bloody pouch with a name tag saying, Ryu. And inside is a human tongue. The doll then says to return it. Ayumi suspects it belongs to the ghost boy, and we now know his name, Ryu. We find him still in the infirmary and make eye contact. Then we give him back his tongue. He turns normal and thanks us, and then an earthquake happens. Which symbolizes the spaces closing. I also have a headcanon that early earthquakes were actually new people arriving. We go back to Satoshi, still waiting outside the corridor. He swears to protect Yuka, which is funny considering he just left her. Or he was teleported here, but he took a while to remember. Turning around, he sees Sachiko watching him. Going back to the infirmary, the door is locked, so Naomi is once again stuck in the infirmary. Going to the body of Seiko, Sadoshi says her name in grief, and we get a horrible description of her state. We then go back to Naomi and get an optional scene, her dream of Seiko. <laughs> It's a strange dream of Seiko dying bleeding from the chest, which never happened. So this might be a weird alternate reality scenario that, well, didn't really happen. Where Satoshi didn't make it in time and Seiko was injured by one of the ghosts and started dying. The more I think about this theory, the more it lines up with the lore in later games. Though this death seems pretty tame. We then get the option of giving Seiko a kiss. If you click not to, the dream instantly ends. If you click yes, Seiko is happy and then dies. You'd have to be really heartless to not click yes. Seiko then gets scared right before dying and they both cry. It's a really sad scene. I'm still going with an alternate version of the event over a dream though. We then do the purple item puzzle again and get the custodian key. We use it on the red door and enter the custodian's closet, but the lights turn off. They know what the bad smell in here, and Naomi has some deja vu of being in this very room. The TV has no power, so we can't use the tape, but they do look at a magazine article about the stories of the occult, the next issue.授業中に突然号泣を始め、抗議を投げ出すような気候もしばしば。The author is trying to locate Sachiko, who would, by now, be a grown woman. We know, however, that she's a ghost child, so this doesn't really make sense. We go back to Ayumi and Yoshiki with the ghost boy now appeased. We follow the same idea. 
find an area where the doll starts speaking, compare it to the notes, and find more body parts. This time though, it isn't a body part, but a winder key. We insert the winder key into the lever and it works, opening up a brand new hall in the school. Going through it, we enter a shower room. Ayumi then starts coughing up blood. Going further outside, the school has an outdoor pool and the pool is very murky and it's kind of hard to see anything. In the pool side, we find the pump room key. We then hear Ayumi say, I've had enough and the sound of someone falling into the pool. We see a quick image of where she is and a timer. Everyone panics. Like if you are enjoying this video and don't subscribe and like with notifications on by the time this timer on screen counts down, there's a possibility of something maybe happening, but what do I know? I don't make the rules. We jump into the pool and have to remember the spot it showed us very briefly. Diving down, Yoshiki finds her and drags her back up. Yoshiki really is the best. He takes her into the shower room and performs CPR. Ayumi explains she heard a voice calling out to her in the pool, thinking it was Yoshiki, and then a spirit took over her. Out of all odds, the rainwater actually helps her get rid of the taste of the pool. I'm honestly shocked that is an acid. We lock the pump room and turn the valve to drain the pool. Then we see all the corpses that were in the pool. The tags mention them being thrown into it, and a nine-year-old who fell and hit his head and drowned. It's very tragic. One note though mentions how they removed the wheel from the pump and threw it into the pool, and that they hid the tongue from the ghost that killed their friends. Now this is really interesting to me because it suggests the other people who died here came close to working out the mystery of Heavenly Host. There's so many other stories that have gone on in this one location. And if they'd appeased the ghosts with the tongues, they might have had a better chance of escaping, but because of revenge, they hid it away and probably died here somewhere. We find the wheel in the drainage part of the pool, and turn it on, and then go to the pool and find the bloody bag with the tongue in it. <coughs> Inspecting the pool note on the fence, the text falls and the skull says, Where are you taking that? Give it back. Really weird to see Tex falling in a 3D skull now, since no other note actually had that. We find two ghosts and have to make sure to give the right tongue, the headless girl called Takiko, I think. We appease her and she disappears, but Yuki is still there and we don't have hers yet. The final location, well, the antique doll tells us where your friend was splattered. So we have to dig around Mayu's remains. Just another cruelty added on to this place. Though Moshige comes down the stairs, which wait a minute, if in this dimension then he's somehow crossed over? So Moshige is here, happy to see them. Moshige explains him losing consciousness and then waking up here, feeling the air had changed. So our theory is correct about them moving around when the closed spaces shrink. Moshige actually has the bloody tongue in his pocket, which also means he dug around the corpse. And he gives us Yuki's tongue, which for a ghost girl sounds way too close to Yuka. Ah, then Moshige goes off on his own again. Ayumi is freaked out because she noticed his hands were bloody, meaning he had his hands in the corpse of the person he's trying to find. We offer the tongue, then Yuki thanks us. 
We have successfully appeased the ghosts. All that's left is the ghost in the red dress. Suddenly though, a massive earthquake happens. Yoshiki then Ayumi wake up and they are back in their classroom. Yoshiki has the best reaction to this. Shinozaki then screams and we see why. The curses start leaking into the real world. Very far future foreshadowing. Out of the curse, Yuki appears and starts speaking about the day she was kidnapped. Her tone is shyer and she doesn't seem to have an evil look anymore. Apparently Yoshikazu was a very kind man. She then calls Yoshiki and Ayumi nice people and thanks them for giving back the tongues. However, she then reveals we didn't succeed. Yuki then tells us that appeasing doesn't depend on forgiveness but repentance between the criminal and the victim. She also tells us more about her being the fragments of the curse, and that even the doll's repentance was not enough. Yoshiki then incorrectly states that she trapped them there. Ayumi then mentions how her sister talked about lost souls who died violently with the regrets, turns kind people into hatred or vengeful spirits. Yoshiki then deduces that Ayumi's sister is a medium because of course she is. She took these two to safety because the curse was lifted from her, but she can't help the others since the closed spaces have killed so many people that it's literally filled to the brim with vengeful spirits and sorrow and agony and pain. And with them being concepts that have nowhere to go, the place they feed on is the minds of those bound there, the minds who died there, and the ghost children. So Yuki being a kind spirit is only temporary, sadly. <laughs> The only way to save everyone else is to return the closed spaces, then find all four victims, put them to rest, and then with the cogs being gone, the closed spaces will fall apart. So they have been given the worst decision. Do you go back into hell itself, possibly die for the slim chance of saving everyone else? Or do you take your survival as the only known survivors of Heavenly Host and leave your friends to try and escape on their own? Now pausing here, this cutscene is probably one of the most violent and disturbing ones ever. I'm probably gonna have to censor it and then briefly show images, so let's replace it at the violent scenes with a more heartwarming scene. Here we go, a cute bunny, and I guess the audio might be fine to use. Okay, now we can continue. Ayumi wakes up in a dark basement surrounded by three kids blindfolded. We then cut back to Naomi and Satoshi listening to the note. Sachiko, the girl in the red dress, being the only survivor of the murders, with afterwards fleeing with her family. But the author was unable to find any information on Sachiko afterwards. <laughs> We then go back to Ayumi in the flashback being unable to move due to sleep paralysis. She has taken the role of Yuki in the incident. The children are crying out for help with Yoshikazu mentioning eyes with his barely understandable speech. With the blindfold Ayumi now has, her sense of hearing is increased, which will be very traumatic. Yoshikazu then says, in order. Uh, let's replace some of the music to be copyright free. <laughs> nice, I'll just explain it. Ayumi says, I've never heard screaming like this before. It's pure primal terror cutting through the air in perfect sin wave and then horrible stabbing sounds of a child. Man, they really went all out with this audio. Yeah, I ain't for I'm not risking this. Uh, I'll cut back eventually, but Ayumi is now saying, why isn't God allowing him to fall unconscious so he doesn't have to suffer? More stabbing sounds, like a lot, then he dies, and then next we hear the screams of the girl, and the sounds of stabbing, with gurgles since her head has been removed. Then it's Yuki or Ayumi's turn to be killed, the blindfold is removed, and the face of the killer revealed. But before we can see it, we cut back to the notes. 
speaking about the inhumanely horrific sight of the murders. The murder weapon was a large pair of sewing scissors, while also describing that the full strength of the man hadn't been used. The note then describes in detail the causes of death from the testament of Sachiko Shinozaki herself. Then we cut back to Ayumi with the blindfold removed. She sees the truth. The killer was one of the children, Sachiko Shinozaki. Goddamn Pikachu, you lunatic. We hear Yoshikazu crying in the background while Sachiko keeps giggling. Then Ayumi gets stabbed in the eye. She was stabbed in the eye so many times until it became soup-like in consistency. That's a detailed description. Yuki then bled to death. Now, I know I tried to make this a little less brutal and add some humor, but if I'm being honest, this scene is one of the most disturbing things in a game you can listen to. I can't think of an equivalent, honestly. The point is to show how horrible the murders are, but the audio in Fool is very horrific and is quite realistic sounding. You actually feel quite sick after this section. If you haven't played the game and are curious, just be warned, it's very, very disturbing and full, especially in this replay where I had way better headphones. Those voice actors really deserve all the props. Then the real truth is only after all the injuries were the tongues removed. The author then has a theory, did Yoshikazu actually murder the children, which we now know he didn't. The author then speaks about how powerful this curse could be and that the basement of Heavenly Host is some form of cursed ground even before the murders. They then speak of the demolition of the school, but the protege has found something and we learn the name of the author, Ku Kabiki. Then the chapter ends, and next we have the final chapter in the game. But first as always, the wrong ends, and in this chapter, and then the last, they get a lot more complicated in how to get them. You can mess up as early as the first minutes of the chapter, and not know till halfway in or even the end. The first wrong end is if we fail to save Naomi and she dies, hanging herself accidentally. What then happens is the game goes on and we go into the infirmary and a panicking girl called Toko is there, with a bruise from a punch on her cheek. She then describes Kizami as going crazy and pushing one of their friends down the stairs, then playing with the body. She then asks if we had come to kill her and we can respond yes or no. Doesn't really matter which, she charges at Satoshi with scissors and stabs him. If we picked up Naomi and Seiko's phone, this time when she stabs us, the phone takes the hit. Sadoshi then gets angry and throws the scissors away, but Toko won't speak anymore, just panicking in fear. Leaving, Miss Yui appears, and we haven't seen her since the start. Now I'm not going to update the explainer since this is still a wrong end. It seems Miss Yui found Naomi and Seiko's corpse, and she's still injured. They then agree to look for Yuka, it then cuts back to actual Miss Yui in the purple clothes space, and we then get a flashback of Miss Yui as a teacher in the school losing motivation, with the parents calling her useless. Mr. Yamazaki then tells her how much the students care for her and how she's helping them. We then see the truth. Miss Yui is dreaming a dream where Naomi and Seiko died. We then hear Ayumi scream for Miss Yui and see that she is crushed by rubble, dying which is very different from when we last saw her. We then get a montage of each of the student characters speaking to Miss Yui. This isn't called a wrong end though, it's an extra end with Miss Yui's weird dream. The other wrong end is if the ghosts catch you, which is a repeat of the other wrong ends of ghosts catching you, with the pupil enlarging and them seeing a familiar face before screaming. The other wrong end happens if Ayumi drowns and you don't save her on time. The more grisly one happens if you decide to drain the pool with her in it, which Obviously isn't a good idea. So naturally, Ayumi gets sucked into the drain and mangled. Ayumi sure has some violent wrong ends. They actually show her corpse a lot as well. Now with all the wrong ends of chapter 4 done, we go on to the final chapter. Alright, before we go on to the final chapter, I want to thank you all for making it this far. This video has been a long time in the making for one of my favourite games, and I hope you are all enjoying. Now the last chapter of Coach Party is where the plot gets very informational and there's a lot to explain. So now would be the best time if you are so engrossed to stretch, get food, drink, 
key because Yuka won't, and just get ready for the final chapters of the story. But like I mentioned, we still got a lot more after the final chapter. I'm sorry. So hopefully you are all liking this, and yeah, you may have noticed that I'm using a different character avatar from Corpse Party for this, and it's for these intermissions before the super informational parts of the video, which will most likely be the final chapter in like all of them. And I want to show off some of my favorite characters, you know, inject a bit of personality of my own into this, if I haven't done that already. So for example, right now we hear a very masculine, manly voice coming from Tifa Lockhart. You're just going to have to deal with that, I'm afraid. Now, let's get ready for the final chapter of Corpse Party Blood Covered, Chapter 5. The wrong ends here are very long now and can happen from the first choice, but you won't see it till the end of the chapter. Chapter 5 opens with Ayumi living out Yuki's murder. I don't think we need to show too much more of this, but they really love using the word soup-like consistency. We get back to Yuka now, scared on the ground with Kizami. Yuka then asks what Kizami's sister was like, and he describes Yuka perfectly. <laughs> then Yuka realizes the warning signs and tries escaping, but Kizumi then says, I am your big brother. Fleeing downstairs, Yuka finds Kurosaki still alive but dying on the ground. He tells Yuka to run as Kizumi is following behind her. Kizumi then kicks Yuka to the floor. Kurosaki though distracts Kizumi before he can kill Yuka by telling him sorry. Kurosaki then punches him, which pisses off Kizumi, so he takes out the knife and plays him. Yuka then wakes up to the gruesome sight with Kizami bloodied and now chasing after Yuka with the knife. Kizumi also takes his science lab key and then claims it doesn't matter who kills you, the spirits are him. Trying to run past causes Sachiko to drop the shell. Going to where Sachiko was, we get the front entrance key. The sequence is really scary, getting chased while Kizumi is taunting you around the building. It's probably the scariest part of the game. The rest I wouldn't really call a scary game, more disturbing and atmospheric, but this part is pretty terrifying. Ghost Party really shows the fear of the characters well, and that's something I'll explain more about at the end. Escaping into the main building, Kizumi is still following, but Sachiko tells us to follow her. <laughs> We run down the corridor and Kizami says his famous phrase in English. Run! Run it run! <laughs> As he says it though, Yoshikazu appears from behind and hits him with the hammer. <laughs> we then see Moshige panicking, being unable to find Mayu. He's starting to feel the effects of not having drink or food. We get a flashback about Mayu and Moshige. Mayu convinces Moshige to keep being an actor, you know, typical theater kid problems. Moshige is starting to feel the effects of loneliness as well, but in his words, the suffering of others is the only thing that keeps him sane. Wow. So that's what he has been doing, taking pictures of corpses. These theater kids, man. His favorite piece, of course, the one that was pulverized against the wall. He then laughs at her being embarrassed if there is an afterlife. Unfortunately for deep breathing corpse weirdo, the phone starts ringing and then he answers and he hears Mayu telling him to not look at the picture. <laughs> Don't 
don't look at me. So with this fact, is Crush your best friend telling you do not look at their insides or their corpse that you have been laughing about and mocking? So it obviously makes them go a tiny bit insane. After that, we get back to seeing Satoshi and Naomi again, with them both saying they saw Sachiko in earlier chapters. They don't have the knowledge about Sachiko being the killer though, and an earthquake happens suddenly, and Satoshi gets hit by a falling ceiling beam. Satoshi! Satoshi! There's a... There's a man! We then go back to Ayumi and Yoshiki, with Ayumi waking up from reliving Yuki's murder. Ayumi then reveals that the doll wasn't enough because Yoshikazu wasn't the killer, Sachiko was. Ayumi is wondering why the man quaking in fear even helped Sachiko. And then with this knowledge, is determined to tell the others since Sachiko will kill them. She wants to go back and Yuki tells her it's not a good idea and explains that due to the main cast, the spaces are in critical flux and that because of this, there would be no way for the ghost children to be able to bring them back. So now they have the decision, save the friends with the new knowledge or stay in the living world. Ayumi has made up her mind. But we get to choose for Yoshiki. In the true ending, you have to go back. So we're now back in Heavenly Host. Yuki then apologizes and gives us something that will help Satoshi and the others. A marble statue of a demon. No. Sachiko right now is following everyone around the school closely. She then tells us we need to find a red statue as well. Now that the ghost tongues are given back and they are temporary not hostile, the closed spaces have begun to collapse into one. She then gives us a final bit of wisdom to appease Sachiko by appealing to her humanity. Ayumi then explains that if the closed spaces are closing down, they must now all be in the same dimension of the school. And so, for the final time, we go back to the corpse party dimension explainer. With all the closed spaces now merging into one, the red one. So, every alive character is now in this one. We go back to Yuka and she tries hiding in the toilet. She's also peed herself because she didn't use the damn bucket. Yuka then starts exploring around, but Sachiko was following her. Back to Ayumi and Yoshiki and they notice the whole school is completely different. And more importantly, the chapter 5 music starts now, and let me just say it's so damn catchy. They know the air here is different, and I think this is the truest form of Heavenly Host and what it might have looked like in the past. Ayumi then finds Naomi's Sachiko scrap and student ID on the ground. Looks like she dropped it at some point. We then get uh, the weirdest scene of Yuka. Oh, how the hell do I explain this? Yeah, it's a Yuka flashback and it's weird. Sadashi then wakes up and feels something meaty in his hand. Where is this going? And it went there. A cameraman called Taguchi, who takes the video for Kabiki, starts talking on the TV, but it's a video recording by him. <laughs> We learn they entered here without Naho since this place is dangerous and they didn't want Naho to enter a dangerous place. They then find their first corpse and see the uniform is recent, with Taguchi saying, Kabiki knows a way out. We go back to Ayumi and find more stories of the occult articles by Ku. With him now writing about his experience in the cursed school, we learn his protege is Naho, who can speak with spirits which is how she found out how to even enter the school in the first place. Ayumi then says he spoke of Naho as his cash cow. She comes to the conclusion they are only in this place because they messed up the charm and angered Sachiko. She then starts blaming herself. Weirdly, Ayumi says Seiko's name as well, but she shouldn't know she died unless in the bathroom she didn't say the name out loud. I guess she did sense someone close to them had died. They then finally meet up. Yoshiki, 
It then fades to black and they mention that Mayu and Seiko have died. They then tell Satoshi and Naomi that the killer is Sachiko, so be careful of her. Naomi and Satoshi then explain that there was a way out, but they don't fully know yet since the tape was cut off. So they both have knowledge of two different ways to escape. However, if they don't stop the curse, these killings will keep on happening. Or we could take down the website. Ayumi then starts getting angry at Naomi, showing that she's becoming affected by the darkening. Sadoshi suggests him and Naomi look for Yuka while Ayumi and Yoshiki search for Miss. Naomi says take care to Ayumi, but she responds back with, don't get too close. So Ayumi's worst trait of jealousy is starting to come forth at the worst possible time because of the school curse beginning to affect her more. Then Yoshiki kind of tells her she's scowling and they forgot to give back the scrap and ID. Ayumi then scolds herself for her personal feelings. But Yoshiki kind of downplays it, which makes Ayumi feel better about herself. I don't know if that was the right call though. Now the gameplay has us switch parties between pentagrams to play different parts. I always like this gameplay mechanic in games. Solving a puzzle of two sets of groups together is always fun. And most of the time has pretty creative ideas. Naomi and Satoshi wander around a while and then they found the corridor has opened up to the second building. With Naomi having never been in there. ナオミ、大丈夫かうん。聖子の最後の言葉が耳から離れない。大丈夫だ。お前のせいじゃない。元気づけてくれたサトシには、ああ言ったけど。靴も揃えて置いてあったし。They find Yuka's shoes beside the body of Kurosaki. We see Yuka again, having lost her shoes, and Sachiko starts taunting her and laughing at her, saying she's going to wring her neck. We then go back to Naomi and Sadoshi and find blood everywhere in the stairwell and a phone, Moshige's phone, with a video recording saved to memory. This recording is him going insane then smashing his head into the window, which is the school playing a cruel trick since windows shouldn't be breakable. Moshige went crazy finding out that he was obsessed with Mayu's corpse and then slammed his head repeatedly into a window. So Moshige fell and died, or did he? We then find Yuka in the other building, just in a corner, so I guess she ran from Sachiko. They then find tape 2 on the ground next to her. The corridors and halls are all more claustrophobic now. Activating a lever it makes a part of a pathway. Then heading back to the custodian closet, we see what happened to Kabiki and his last tape. <laughs> Naho actually strangled him while sounding possessed. They open the door beside them and find the corpse of Kabiki as well as the corpse of Naho. Naomi then asks if there's a gap in the back of the room, which she just had a feeling about that being there. They find a ladder and climb it and we can choose to send Yuka ahead of Sadoshi go up first. The ladder leads to the girl's bathroom and a familiar star from chapter 1. They then find another mini tape. Switching to Ayumi's group, they find Naho's notebook. We learn she was doing an investigation in Heavenly Host Elementary School, and that she discovered how to enter in which it must be two or more people to work. Naho also knows how to leave. She also went to the Shinozaki estate itself and found spiritual resistance. I wonder if we will ever go there. We can see Naho is determined to get Kabiki to be recognized and she really admires him. What's funny is Naho was the person Ayumi admired the most, her hero. We find more of Naho's notes and she has figured out that Kabiki came here behind her back and blames the cameraman. She told him a simple way to escape and she also dragged her friend Sayaka into all this. Because she needed two people to enter. This part of the game is just finding the notes so the next one speaks about how to reverse the effects and return home with Ayumi saying, Pay dirt. 
While walking, blood splatters in a window and we then see Sachiko enter the room, so this can't be good. Kizumi's name tag is also on the floor. Inside they walk up to an anatomical model and we read more of Naho's notes in this room. She originally thought it was just a plane of spirits and that if they don't escape they will be in danger. Her way out isn't shown to the player yet though. Naho's note then ends with her getting obsessive over Kabiki. They turn back and the model has moved. It then tries grabbing Shinozaki and it chases us as well as Yoshikazu. We grab the lab key at the bottom and the description saying Kizumi had this. So we know what the ID, who the anatomical model was or is. We then escape the room and go to the infamous classroom 1A, feeling a bit nostalgic for it now and with Naho's last note it's filled with her emotions and it's really creepy and obsessive with her smelling him. The letter then just starts writing itself because they are cursed. She describes the effect of darkening happening to her but her object of obsession is Kabiki. Her notes then go over five and she found Kabiki and she wants to hug him. But then the darkening took over and we see from the tape that she ended up strangling him. <laughs> Now having read all the notes, we go into the reference room and find Naho. We tell her that Sachiko was the real killer. She has a cocky look, saying we only solved half the mystery since we don't know who Sachiko is. Naho is still looking for Kabiki, she sort of mirrors Moshige in a way. Ayumi though stops her because she's worked out another thing about this. <laughs> And she wrote it on purpose to trap people in the school. Because who could have guessed that the dodgy website blog by a self-proclaimed spirit speaker would be lying? We then get to see what Ayumi truly read, and the actual instructions require one more chant for Sachiko herself. She also mentions that an actual official doll exists in the Shinozaki state, but paper dolls also work. So there's more to the charm that existed before the blog, obviously. The charm does nothing, but a spirit passes through. Doesn't even work for the friendship thing. But do it wrong and Sachiko herself curses you and takes you to the sacred ground. And to atone, you must do the ritual correctly but in reverse. So Naho purposely made the instructions wrong because she wanted Kabiki to have more sample size for a crappy article. Naho you are sadistic. Then she starts laughing and saying the worst insult comeback, go fish? <laughs> Yeah, Yoshiki, I'm not impressed either. Then Naho says, wow, okay, the channeling from FF7OG. Ayumi doesn't let her off the hook though. Naho is a yandere. I would have chosen more colorful words, Ayumi, but you got the point across. Then Ayumi plays the ultimate card and reminds Naho how she died because she forgot. She avoided being swallowed by the school because of her spiritual energy. It'll make more sense in later games, kind of. But Ayumi then carefully tells her that she killed her obsession, Kabiki. And the evil Naho takes it well and starts, uh. <laughs> vomiting out her darkening, levitating, and then being absorbed by the curse. So that went jolly. Well, it is a horror game, Yoshiki. Naho drops a baby statue, eh, okay. We meet back up with the rest of the gang now with Yuka in which they tell them Moshige is dead even though they didn't find the body. Ayumi then says skill issue and then starts crying over her friends dying. In this meeting, they finally give back the ID and charm to Naomi. We then hear the rest of what Naho said, that the way out idea won't work because the spirits block the way out. 
so you have to appease them to cut through the plane of void and back to the living world. Without doing this, it would be dangerous, so you can't just leave by doing the charm correctly again. You must appease the ghosts. The plan of void was made by all the ghosts and Sachiko and surrounds the whole area. Then another earthquake happens and while walking down a corridor it opens up and they fall into a pit of bugs or Naomi does and this is one of my worst nightmares. And to make it worse, there was a time of 11 seconds to make it and the path is hidden. So making it just in time, Satoshi pulls us to safety. Then we place the statues in the podium which now leads to the infirmary with Naomi mentioning how she was attacked here earlier by the Black Shadow. Yuka is also having a headache from the air. We suddenly start hearing children chanting a tune. <laughs> As Satoshi looks out the window, we see what he describes as a child's face and hands in the window. The notice outside says, Sachiko, clean up in the reference room. Please wait here for me until I'm done. Then a character named Yoshi says to come in. Satoshi has also gotten a nosebleed from the air. Inside, Yoshi starts speaking and we see her ghost, the true identity of the shadow, who has paralyzed Satoshi since he stared at her. She speaks about her dear Sachi, she's my pride and joy, and does that sound familiar? Full circle moment, this is the dialogue we saw at the very opening of the game. I love it when they do that. Weirdly, the PS Vita version of this game actually had the sprites for the ghosts glow more than this pretty dim light. Sachi then moves over to the diary and Yoshi is writing saying she is dead. We then see her spirit and now her neck is twisted in an unnatural state. She repeats, I won't forgive you and I'm going to kill you. How dare you harm Sachiko, and how dare you harm me. Satoshi then grabs the diary and flees. As he ran out, children started appearing around her. We didn't get to see this though. The diary is now able to be read, and they find out her name is Yoshi Shinozaki, Sachiko's mother, not the Mario character. The nurse in Heavenly Host Elementary. The start of the diary speaks of her talking about the children in her school. She then speaks about raising Sachiko right, and on her seventh birthday, she got her a cat plushie. While she was sorting out documents, the principal came by and started to assault her by unbuttoning her blouse. She speaks about his eyes being cold and empty, different from before. She ran away, but he pushed her down the stairs, killing her when she broke her neck. Her daughter Sachiko saw everything, then the principal caught her and strangled her to death to keep her quiet. He then rebuttoned her shirt and buried Sachiko in the basement, claiming her death was an accident and that Sachiko was missing. <laughs> Yoshi's spirit, now filled with vengeance, starts hating the new nurse. Yoshi then starts talking about how the darkening curse is taking over her mind. Naomi points out that the date of the diary isn't adding up since this happened 20 years ago before the Heavenly Host murders. The diary continues on, listing the agony and regret the nurse Yoshi, not the Mario character, had. The diary eventually can't be turned anymore due to the thick blood. But skipping through, he can turn some pages which just say, Sachi is my pride and joy. 20 years later. She'd do anything for me. She's even killed a lot of people to keep me company. She sent so many children, I love them all. Then I have to make her stop. This won't make me happy. Sachiko, please stop. Yoshi then curses the entire family. <laughs> then Sachiko, having high spiritual power, managed to reform a flesh and blood body from the curse. 
and Sachiko goes around killing children and sending their souls to her. But Yoshi doesn't want that. She just wants to see Sachiko, which for some reason Sachiko hasn't done. Six more children killed, she also reveals when they die their existence is also removed from history in the living world as if they were never real. We also learn that Sachiko has been using Yoshikazu to do the kidnappings, somehow gaining control over him. Then Sachiko eventually starts killing for her own enjoyment, becoming a vengeful spirit which is when she becomes Red Dress Sachiko. She was killing to make sure her mum wasn't lonely but now she's doing it for fun, completely taken over. Then Yoshi herself starts getting taken over by the curse repeating kill more and bring more, losing her humanity and contradicting what she had previously said about not wanting kids killed. She speaks about the instant children being sent to her aka killed. Yoshi also says Sachiko probably doesn't even recognize her anymore. Then in the 18th of November 1975, Heavenly Host officially gets closed and the principal jumps off the roof. Yoshi then wants to sing with the dead children to celebrate. She then speaks about Sachiko wandering the empty halls of the Heavenly Host spirit dimension, killing anyone who enters, which they entered from rumors. She then speaks about being thirsty, but they can't ever taste or drink again. Then all the writing becomes a jumbled mess. Now they have to go to the principal's office to solve more of the mystery, but we now know what turned Sachiko mad and why she originally started killing. Here's a plot hole how she actually gained a body and why the kids had their identity known when the others disappeared. I guess Sachiko wanted cogs for the closed spaces, or I don't know, it's a plot hole. Especially finding out she had killed kids before, so why is it that these particular three were special and helped keep together the closed spaces? We know only Yuki knew of Sachiko's identity because the blindfold was removed to stab her. So did these three children have just high spiritual power? This really isn't explained sadly, but let me know your theories if you have any. Sachiko's power kind of just does whatever it wants in the story though, even letting her do stuff in the real world and kill for some reason. To try and answer this a bit better, because this video is full in depth, I'm going to look at the official timeline in the game's extras, so here we have it that when Sachiko dies in the same year, in September she kills four kids in the real world. Why they aren't part of the school I think, and this is a theory, but I think since Yoshi was kind and caring to the spirit kids and not under the curse at the time, they weren't filled with vengeance and hatred. While then 20 years later when Sachiko uses her power to create an identity and memory of her existing in the real world, then kills the three, why their existence wasn't erased, who knows maybe Sachiko wanted them to not be so that the school reputation could suffer, I'm sure she probably has that power. Then I don't know, somehow kids find a way into Heavenly Host but then not much happens to Naho's blog which goes mainstream. Uh, it's still a plot hole, but let's just explain it as Sachiko is super powerful and has abilities that can't be explained, like being able to have a body and give a police interview then disappear forever. But her existence still remembered. Yeah, let's go with that. They pick up with the stuffed cat plushie now on the ground. Walking outside the walkway, we hear a scream and a splatting sound. They see the principal of Heavenly Host jumping from the roof, forced to relive his death and suffering for eternity for what he did. Sadoshi sees a key on the body so he jumps over the fence when the principal hits the ground and takes it. He notes the key being smaller, possibly to a desk. They then open the door to the principal's office and we hear the principal speaking that he didn't mean for any of it to happen and he blames Yoshi for her death. Apparently the principal suffered a mental collapse before he died with papers all over the room. We pick up a bag from the desk drawer filled with blood, inside a human tongue, Sachiko's tongue. As Satoshi touches it, he relives a moment from her past, being buried in the basement by the principal. Sachiko has been haunting and invading his mind, filling it with bad dreams, sending him to the edge, causing him to think she's not dead, and then for him to dig up her body since he's gone so mad, he thinks her corpse will tell on him. So he takes a pair of scissors and cuts the tongue from her corpse, which is why Sachiko took the tongues off her victims. Sachiko 
死んだふりをしているんだ。<笑>だがね、私には立場があるんだ。They find a secret passage at the back of charms put there by the principal, him being scared of what lies beyond it. As they enter, we cut back to Ayumi and Yoshiki back in the reference room. They see a principal who, I'm not gonna lie, looks exactly like Van from Harvest Moon and Wonderful Life. If you know what I'm talking about, give yourself a cookie. The principal's visage leaves behind a scrapbook that has all the newspaper articles relating to the murder case, with Sachiko being suckled in a red pen, then a newspaper from 50 years ago about the death of Yoshi and the missing report. Sachiko. So someone made the connection that Sachiko was existing in two different time periods as a young girl. And I'm gonna guess it's the principal. Leaving they see Sachiko in the hallway and run to the stairwell to hide. They get paralyzed though and can't speak. They then see a flashback of Sachiko in a white dress, not red, walking up the stairwell. They see Yoshi getting chased by the principal and pushed down the stairs. <laughs> Sachiko, having witnessed it, begins to cry and tries running away, but as we know, the principal catches her and finds her hiding in the toilet, then drags her back to her mum's corpse. So they see Sachiko get strangled, then the principal starts walking towards Ayumi, saying she saw, but Yoshiki breaks free and grabs Shinozaki and runs. Ayumi and Yoshiki also work out that the body of Sachiko is most likely in the cursed basement. We find Kibiki's note and explains more about the darkening. How the school is cursed, a curse that chips away at a person's core, sanity, reason, even identity. Then destroying their existence, once the effect starts to happen, you succumb to despair and loneliness. With the essence of what makes you human, eaten away as if by worms. Your soul and body becoming dark as ash, becoming part of the curse themselves. And if the way to enter became mainstream per se, it would be always getting souls. Though in rare moments, the darkening can instead cause violent thoughts and emotions. Kabiki then gives advice to any victims trapped in the school to always hang on to hope. <laughs> they come to a gap and obviously we have to enter a room. Entering, there's a pentagram on the floor, so how would you know? Not stay in the room? Ayumi then says black magic has been set up in this room, or witchcraft, so hint, don't stand on it. Just, I don't know, leave. Then Ayumi tells Yoshiki to go on ahead, but she didn't want to say that, and she actually didn't say that. Then Yoshiki leaves her, which by now you would think they would understand, don't split up in chapter 5. I'm sure nothing bad's gonna happen. Shocker, something bad has happened. Ayumi is now locked in the room. But then Miss Yui appears in the game again and follows her. Then the room starts shaking and the floor turns on itself. Ayumi and Miss Yui hang on for dear life with Ayumi climbing on Miss Yui to safety. Then she stands there and they are about to grab her hand, but Miss Yui tells them to leave since the floor could collapse, but we see it's just a trap, so nah, I'm helping, but they don't, and Miss Yui falls and dies. So that's when that extra end takes place, when she had fallen and been crushed, and that her dream was with Satoshi failing to save Naomi. Kinda annoyed they show Miss Yui at the start and then she just randomly appears to die again. They should have at least tried saving her. They know she was injured, but moving on from Miss Yui as the plot also did, they see the principal again and he walks into an incinerator. <laughs> Yoshiki spots a yellow ribbon in the incinerator which they think is Sachiko's. So they reach their hand into an incinerator because in a cursed school that's something smart to do. Then they see a squatting ghost spirit inside and it's Sachiko herself who then starts crawling into the machine. So Yoshiki decides he will crawl into an incinerator. Then Ayumi follows, and what also follows is a claustrophobic worst nightmare. Sachiko then eventually tells them to turn back, also saying, please turn back, but once not cruelly. <laughs> 
Though when we go further, Sachiko seemingly hit us. <laughs> and we go back to Naomi and Satoshi and Yuka. Now in an abandoned bomb shelter that was accessed in the principal's office. A full underground tunnel maze system. Then Yuka has to pee again so Yuka just literally piss on the floor. Then we find severed heads all lined up on tables. Long tables with severed heads of victims of the school. I guess Yoshikazu under the cusp had some corpses to display them. Some have decomposed and others are just skulls. Walking up we see a blue spirit. Following the spirit... We make it to the other side, and the cameraman Taguchi runs into the group. He's shocked to find living people, but once he sees Naomi, he screams and runs away. <laughs> Come on, she's not ugly. We walk up and find another spirit puzzle, this time with the kids singing a song. We follow the pattern and make it without falling, but for fun, here's some information about this chant. It's actually called Torinis, and it's used in Japan commonly when it's safe to cross at a crosswalk. The lyrics, however, work with corpse party lore quite perfectly. Since in this part we have to pass through safely and to enter Heavenly Host, it's easy, but turning, it's not. But Sachiko had just turned seven on the day she was killed, and Heavenly Host's name in Japanese is Tenjin, and it's scary. So this well-known song works too perfectly with this game in this section. We enter a room that's dark and smells horrible called the dissection room. The lights turn on and we see buckets of blood, flies, tables with blood and body parts in the buckets, chains hanging from walls and bone saws and bloody pliers. Inspecting the corpse in the corner it says Nana which sounds familiar. We might see that name again. She had her tongue removed and then died. We then find the name Chihaya who was dissected in the underground room and Cramped into a bucket, age 13. Oh, that's a rough one. Going to leave the room, they hear footsteps getting closer and decide to hide under the table. They don't have much time to debate where else to go, so they all kind of shuffle under it. We then hear Taguchi running and screaming. Stuck in this room, he hides in the closet. Footsteps are heard and we see Yoshikazu's feet standing right in front of us. Suddenly Yoshikazu drops Seiko's body right in front of Naomi, causing her to whimper. Her soulless dead eyes staring at us with a twisted neck reminding us what happened to her. Yoshikazu then starts draining the blood from Seiko's body into a bucket. Seems Yoshikazu collects up the bodies like a janitor. Suddenly though, he charges into the closet finding Taguchi who he then kills with his hammer. <laughs> Yoshikazu then leaves with the body and Naomi starts crying before running after him. We follow Seiko's blood but then go left and see a bathroom so Yuka can finally use the toilet. She does but blood starts overflowing, a reference to one of her wrong ends in the original game. <laughs> Sachi then decides this is a good time to ask Yuka if there's a boy she likes while Naomi has just emotionally ran after a zombie man with the hammer who kills people but no they have a chat. Yuka then says there's a boy from her class and Sadoshi says she hopes she will have the courage to tell him how she feels then relates that to him and Naomi with Naomi acting tsundere towards him so we haven't really seen much of that in the game. Then he says if he ever lost her he might as well be dead which is nice and all except the fact you just saw her chase after the hammer dude. You're about to lose her. Instead, started talking to Yuka about her crush. Like Sadashi, hurry up, but nope, now he says seeing her run away has made him realize he's in love with her. This scene actually leads to a wrong end, but we are just continuing on as if it's the true end. The Bletcho stops though, and we have to choose which way to go, though if you go one way, it warns you basically don't go this way, Dumbo. So we don't, and go left. We then cut back to Ayumi, who is in a room which is just a sea of corpses. This room is like where Yoshikazu stores corpses to not have every single part of the school be a corpse. It's like spring cleaning. Yoshiki is nowhere to be found though, but then we hear him calling out. He's stuck in the sea of corpses, kind of. He then gives the greatest line of any video game character ever. Oh, 
Then he jumps out the corpses and explains he went down a different chute which would have led to the pool. We then find a corpse that belongs to Sayaka, Naho's friend in which she succumbed to darkening and faded while looking for her great friend Naho. Fantastic person for making her come here. Then they leave and find Satoshi's group but they still don't know where Naomi went. I tell the others about how Miss Yui died so it's really just them now. <laughs> We cut back to Naomi who finds a TV in a room. Then we suddenly cut back to the rest of the group and Yuki starts speaking to them. She tells Ayumi the darkness is starting to affect her but she still has time to resist. But she has to hurry hence her outburst earlier. Sarashi asks about Naomi but is told she is fighting her own demons as she is also under the effect of darkening. But must overcome it alone. We are then told we need to appease Sachiko to escape, and they then move on to the next room and find the hanging, rotting corpse of Yoshikazu. Then into the next room where everyone has a horrible headache, a pitch black room, till they hear a digging sound, followed by Sachiko's corpse buried in the basement in her white dress. The ghost children are beside it. Sachiko's spirit then tells them to look away and to leave. We then see what Naomi has been watching as Taguchi with the camera recording Heavenly Host. We see him hear noises upstairs. He hides though. We hear Seiko saying, don't do this. Then we see Naomi herself with Yoshikazu hanging Seiko. Naomi is the one who killed Seiko. We then cut back to Sachiko now appearing in her red dress form with the scissors. She has frozen them all. She then approaches Yuka and stabs her with the scissors, but the group can't do anything to stop it. Then Sachiko's white dress appears in front of them. We go back though and see Seiko getting killed, begging Naomi to stop. Naomi herself using the bucket to hang her with Seiko pleading her to wake up. This is why Taguchi ran away from Naomi when he saw her. Interestingly, that means Taguchi was also in this closed space, meaning Naomi wasn't the only one alive, so they lied to her. They offer Sachiko's tongue, they don't give Naho's notebook, then Satoshi explains how Yoshi, her mum, is suffering and what she's doing by killing kids isn't what she wants. We then offer her black cat plushie and white Sachiko starts asking for her mother and the group can now move again. Red dress Sachiko cries out in pain as her vengeful soul gets appeased. Then Naomi herself appears. They all take out their paper doll scraps and perform the Sachiko charm correctly this time. One time for everyone than one time for Sachiko herself. Her body then disappears. Naomi says she'll explain what happened to Seiko later. Yuki then tells them that the veil between the cursed world and the living is thin and the gate is open. All they have to do is rush outside in time and complete the ritual. But unfortunately once everything closes, everything will turn back to the way it was and the ghost children will have become part of the curse and they can't be saved, meaning they go back to their vengeful murderous ways. But the school now turning Yuki into the next Sachiko as her uniform turns red. We now have a timer counting down with a school bell ringing and we have to run all the way through the school again, following the correct pattern for spirit puzzles but now leaving through into the main building, so hopefully you remembered how to navigate the school. We make it outside for the final bell rings and then all they have to do is climb over the fence to escape. Doing it, it flashes white, then darkness. Then a rainstorm is heard, then the light flickers on, and they are back in their classroom at Kisaragi Academy. They have escaped the school at the cost of Seiko, Miss Yui, Mayu, and Moshige. They celebrate being home, the feeling of relief and happiness is indescribable. <laughs> <laughs> 
Satoshi describes him sleeping like a rock. They go to school the next day, but they had one more sick twist in store. However, before we can get to the epilogue, we need to go through all the wrong ends of this chapter. All the ways it could have gone wrong and terrible mistakes could have been made. And there's a lot, and they are way more extensive than the other chapters, so... Let's see all the ways this story could have ended. Not the true end, but the wrong end. So let's start with the simple wrong ends. This one happens if you get caught in the science lab room by Kizami model or Yoshikazu. Yoshiki charges into the model holding Ayumi. He grabs the gas burner and burns Kizumi, then Yoshikazu runs away. Ayumi starts crying in his arms from relief, telling Yoshiki don't die. But then the model gets up, burning on fire, igniting Yoshiki. Holding onto him as Ayumi runs and Yoshiki dies. The other wrong end happens if we don't escape the bug pit, and this is one of the worst. Not shown, just implied. Naomi drowns in the bug pit, the bugs start digging into her skin. Ugh, yeah! oh, it's the worst one. She dies pretty painfully. Then we have the most interesting wrong end in the game, because technically, it's an extra end. And this happens if you do all things correct except reading all of Naho's notes. Then they only know Kabiki's way out, and not to appease Sachiko. So they meet up in the abandoned bomb shower as they agree to find Naomi, then escape. But Naomi actually appears, unable to find Seiko's body. They go and do the charm correctly, and escape without appeasing Sachiko. Then Yuka wakes up Satoshi and acts as if nothing has happened. Satoshi then gets angry at Yuka for acting so calm, and he goes to school and all the dead people are back to life. Seiko teasing him about being a perv and a lusty boy. Satoshi feels like he's dreaming, no one else but him remembers Heavenly Host, so he starts thinking it's just a nightmare. But then Satoshi starts realizing the whole day is the same as the day he did the charm, and now he has the chance to stop the charm ever happening. And somehow they get to the actual charm part, and what Satoshi does to stop it, he screams at them. You know, instead of grabbing it, faking a heart attack. You know, maybe embarrassing himself, but you know, saving their lives, anything, it probably wouldn't work, but at least you tried. And this leads to a wrong end, where the events of Heavenly Host start up again. Which is actually the sequel, Book of Shadows, which I'll cover on this channel at some point. And it's actually canon, since this end is what leads to Book of Shadows, which then leads to the birthday game, which then means they can actually get the true ending, which we've already seen. I'll explain it more in other cosplay videos, but yeah, Satoshi, you dumbo. The next wrong end happens if Naomi doesn't meet up with you, depending on if you go to the bathrooms or not with Yuka in my recap, I just included this scene, but if you do go to the bathrooms, go back and look for Naomi. You see a figure in the distance that looks like her, but she seems to be dragging something. We then hear Naomi approach, screaming and carrying Seiko's corpse with red bloodshot eyes, as she then uses Seiko's body to beat the group to death. The other wrong end happens if you fail to appease Sachiko, she then possesses Ayumi, who stabs Satoshi. Then Yoshiki seems like he's being possessed, but that's all it is, there's not really much to this one sadly. The other one happens if you chant wrong or don't escape the school in time. <laughs> They wake up and see Yuki, but this time she's wearing a red dress, the new Sachiko. She giggles, then reveals Heavenly Host, has reset with them trapped in it, again. And this next wrong end is a long one and twisted. We see the full effects of the darkening here. This wrong end either happens if Yuki gets caught or if Yoshiki doesn't go back. Yoshiki then has an argument with Ayumi with him saying he doesn't want to die. Then she fully insults him, calling him many names. With Yoshiki then having the best comeback, saying all she cares about is Satoshi. Which she does mention his name a lot. Yoshiki kind of spit in here. Then he tells her that he loves her, not the best confession, but Yoshiki keeps it real. Ayumi goes back and we play as Yoshiki for a bit. He keeps remembering voices of his friends and feels guilty and starts breaking down. He then wishes to go back. <laughs> Oh, 
出てきてくれ幽霊頼むどこまでかっこ悪いんだよ俺。逃げるところだった俺はあいつらに出会えたおかげで生まれ変われたんだ頼む怖がりの篠崎が頑張ってんだ負けてられるかよ必ず幸子の残悔を引っ張り出してお前らを成仏させてやる<laughs> I actually kind of wish this led to the real end opportunity because all the wrong ends do have the best character development scenes. Yoshiki then sends a text message saying he came, but alone, Ayumi starts succumbing to the darkening even quicker. It also seems that Yumi starts blushing after what Yoshiki said, so this wrong end really is kind of tragic. Speaking of tragic, we cut to Kizumi torturing Yuka. He's tied her down to the science lab room and talks to her about death. And Yumi then starts panicking. Alone, she is very heavily influenced by darkening. Same as Naomi, actually. We then cut back to Kizumi torturing Yuka more, but before he can kill her, Yoshikazu arrives and kills him. Then Sajiko herself arrives. Then we get a cutscene of Yumi meeting Satoshi and Naomi. But it's very different without Yoshiki. The darkening is really taking effect of her taunting Naomi and calling her swear words. Then she does something absolutely horrific and starts taunting her about her scrap of paper. Then asks her to beg for it on her knees. Then she full on burns the scrap and laughs while it burns while Naomi screams. <laughs> ほら、<笑> <laughs> At this point, you would drop kick her down the hole. Ayumi is completely gone and starts coughing up darkening. We have the context now of how so many people have killed others in the school over the curse of the darkening. When Sadashi finds the body of Naho and Kabiki, there's a brown envelope. They open it and both scream. Then we cut to Ayumi. Miss Yui dies, but we don't see the scene. And we find Yoshiki, however, he has succumbed to the darkening since he entered in such a high emotional state. Nomi's comforting Satoshi as he turns his sadness into anger and spots Sachiko from a window, taunting him. He then wanders into a room and finds Yuka's dead, bloodied body, and instantly becomes darkened. A scene, just like some of the dead corpses' stories we read, once they found their little sister's remains. Tadashi, though, in his last moments, is able to tell Naomi that she can escape with Ayumi and gives his scrap to her. We then cut to Ayumi finding the bomb shelter with Naomi having failed to follow Seiko and standing in a corner. Ayumi then tells her Miss Yui is dead. She then sees that Naomi is Satoshi's scrap, though Naomi says it was Yuka's, and then tells her that Yuka has also died. Then Ayumi asks for her scrap, and Naomi, tired, just calls her a jackass. Ayumi actually somehow lost hers. She then kicks Naomi to the ground and beats her to death with a rock, going fully insane. Then she finds Satoshi's darkened state, unable to return since she needed one more person to be able to leave.
って持ち田君がいてくれないと私はどうやって帰るの We then see Naomi's corpse and she's smiling, knowing that Ayumi would be trapped if she killed her. Ayumi has cemented her own fate. And finally, for the wrong end, which is actually an extra end that leads to the credits, basically do everything in the true end, but go to the bathrooms, which I have shown. But I didn't show what happened if you do it truthfully. So Naomi doesn't show up if you go to the toilet, but you read all of Naho's notes. So we do the ritual, escape the school, but this time they spot Naomi at the end of the walkway. Sadashi goes up to her, but Yoshikazu appears behind him, which he doesn't see, since he's in his own world filled with relief to even notice him. As he's about to stab him with scissors, Yuka jumps in the way and Naomi disappears from the darkening curse. Yoshikazu leaves and as Yuka dies, she decides to be weird and have a full love confession. Saying she loves him more than Naomi, more than anyone, and I'm like, damn it, Corpse Party. Why did you have to go weird with this? You ruin Yuka's character even more. Though the next video I'm doing also kind of has this topic. Oh no. Why are both games up? You know what? Let's go back to the wrong end. Yuka's basically jealous of Naomi. Yuka then says, not as a family, as something more. It's really weird. She says, I don't care if it's a lie. I ain't saying it though, because this isn't needed. Yuka's character is really not good at all. The weird stuff is really not good. Why do you have to do this plot point? Then Yuka dies, thank god. And what's the lesson we learned here? If Yuka goes to the toilet, bad things happen, and also incest is bad. Once back, Satoshi hears a sound in Yuka's old room, and glancing through the keyhole, he sees Yuka's eye staring back at him. Not even in her death can Satoshi escape Yuka's weirdness. <laughs> Alright, with all that done, it's time to go to the True End epilogue. We made it. But if you think this video is done, I'm sorry, it's not because there's some extra chapters. Then my overall thoughts on the series. Not the series, the game. Back to the true ending, the survivors go back to the school only to find out the dead friends are not remembered by anyone, as if they never existed. Once you die in Heavenly Host, your existence is removed forever, so they can't even grieve their friends properly. And Heavenly Host still exists with a new Sachiko. The killings will keep going on unless they take down that website, but knowing the curse, that will be impossible. At the end of the day, Naomi asks Satoshi to meet her to chat about something. It's a sunset lit classroom when they meet, and Naomi then takes out her phone and shows him the unsent text message from Seiko. She then tells him what actually happened in Heavenly Host when she was viewing the TV. She also reveals she killed Seiko under the influence of the darkening. We see Naomi succumbing to the darkening, losing all hope, but before she can, her phone pings, distracting her. It's the message from Seiko. She keeps getting sent it though and realizes that this is Seiko telling her that she doesn't blame her for her death and wants her to live. Her spirit is communicating with the phone and has been watching over her since her death, desperately trying to get Naomi to know she forgives her so she can live. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Naomi then tells Satoshi that she was real and she really existed, right? Satoshi answers she was real and she cries about the friends they have lost. And to play on our hearts more, the game ends showing us the photo of everyone that was taken by Moshige at the start of the game. Only we now know four of them are no longer alive. And that's the end of Course Party 2021, or the main story at least. We still have the extra chapters to look at. The first extra chapter has a character called Nana, and if you remember that name, you know what happens to these characters. But now we get to spend some time with them alive, so you can feel even worse about their deaths. Fun! Three characters called Nana, Chihaya, and Nari. They're looking for their friends. We found the body of their friends in the main game. You actually get a wrong end for just not inspecting the toilet, which is funny. If you do, we meet the ghost who shouted to close the damn door, and he's a charming fellow from an older time period. He lives in the store, but doesn't like people disturbing him. He asks them to find his hat and glasses. So they go and look for the ghost's clothes. The stars play a prank until we find the glasses in the superstar glasses. Turns out they were the wrong glasses, so I don't know, Elvis was stuck here, I guess. So they go exploring more and meet a red spirit, telling them they won't find it downstairs. No wonder this guy died here if he's such a bad liar. But downstairs we meet another red spirit who plays a classic, this other guy is lying, so the guy to the west is lying, and the one to the west says the south is a liar. And the south says the two guys north are telling the truth. So, this is a riddle and a very common one, in which the answer is they are all lying and telling the truth. They do both. They are red. You ain't fooling me. So we ignore the lying spirits and find the distinguished glasses. Then we give the ghost the glasses and he looks good in them. Then we find red spirits moving back and forth and these actually hurt and can kill characters if you touch them. We solve the riddle by not trusting the spirit and find Gollum, and then get a key. A key to the infirmary, and that always goes well. In the infirmary, we get the hat, and then they argue with each other. The ghost talks about how thankful he is, then says the funniest thing out of nowhere. Sarabada. I love you! This ghost isn't actually a victim of the curse, he just haunts the actual heavenly host. He's just a normal man. Doesn't even seem to be affected by the curse either, surprisingly. And that's the end. We know how these character stories end, and it's buckets of fun. The extra chapters are really just to get more fun stories or backstories to the characters. The next one is after Moshige loses Yuka when chasing her. We learn he was doing it for fun and didn't actually have any malicious, violent intent. We play as him and take pictures of corpses. He then bumps into Kizumi and his phone falls to the ground, but Kizumi sees the photo of the corpses. Kizumi feels like he's met another kindred soul. It's the blue hair. Never trust a person with dark blue hair in close party. Kizumi then laughs crazily, wanting to meet him again. These extra endings are unlocked by getting wrong ends, so they really are just fun bonuses. The next one, we get more insight into Ayumi's sister, Inoue, in her room at Divination at Hogwarts. Ayumi asks about her job being a medium. It's not exactly the best career path, it feels like. With her reason for joining being she trusted that a higher power was guiding her. Okay. Ayumi's just really feeling insecure about her skills as an illustrator and her sister comforts and reassures her. She also introduces her to Naho's books, so she's set in motion a lot by this butterfly effect. The next one is Fuck You Roy and his two friends from Kizumi's school. They're playing a dating game on the game console and Kurosaki comes in and wants to also play the same game. Fuck You Roy tries acting like he doesn't care, but he also starts playing the game. And that's the whole extra chapter, just boys locker room talk. The next chapter is Miss Yui and Ayumi talking about past crushes. Seems a bit inappropriate to talk with students, Miss Yui, but hey. And she also says she lives a sad, lonely life, but she's only 23 years old. Stop making me feel old. I was so young back then. You're still young. It's not like you're dying any time. Oh. Then Yoshiki comes and Ayumi gets annoyed. Miss Yui then starts becoming a shipper. The next extra chapter is between the classmates showing Naomi and Ayumi and Seiko being nice to each other. Bit of context for how wrong they were acting when they were affected by the curse. There's a culture festival going on, and somehow another class has set up a whole haunted house. I don't even know how that would be possible in just a classroom. Then we get to see more of Kibiki and Naho, with him asking about Tenjin or Heavenly Host. 
He was going to tell her he was leaving without her. Apparently Naho had the ability to read spirits. Yeah, that went well. Then we get a chapter of the murder incident again, but right before it happens. With Sachiko controlling an alive Yoshikazu's mind like a dog. We then see Yuki get blindfolded. Next one is Moshige again, since he didn't get that much with his character in the main game and Mayu just died instantly. Yoshiki and Moshige accidentally bump into each other and it breaks his glasses when he steps on them. Then Mayu spots them and thinks they are walking back hand in hand. It's kind of Moshige's worst nightmare. Then we get a Yuka chapter, yay! She is buying scented beads, the one that did actually help against the spirits. Yuka says the beads keep you safe from injury and something else, but she won't reveal it. You want to guess what that is? It's the power of love. Like, goddamn, Yuka just sucks. The mom overhears though, and they didn't even give her a name, they just called her mom. Then Yuka leaves her, what the actual, socks and underwear and Satoshi, yeah nah, Yuka needs damn therapy or something. Man, this game is great, and then there's weird shit like this, you're like, why? Is there anything redeemable about Yuka? Thankfully we are back in Heavenly Host, and see what happens with Nana, who becomes separated from her friends. We see what caused them to get split up, and it was them getting chased by one of the killer ghosts. Now he snaps at Chihaya, complaining about running, to be fair, probably not best to argue, but also not best to complain, so no one's really doing great here. But Chihaya then starts whining about running and says, she ain't moving, but also won't let them leave her alone, which I mean, you're just gonna get all three killed, can someone try carrying her, you know? Survival of the fittest. Now he runs off, because survival of the fittest, and I can't exactly blame her. Nana then runs off to speak to Nari, and the group splits apart quickly and argues even more. The talk works though, and they go back to check on Chihaya. Nana's school ID fell though between the floorboards, so that's always a bad sign. In which Nana then tells Nari to go on ahead, so they're all separated now. Nana does manage to recover her ID though, and they head back, and the two other girls, they're not there anymore. The Red Spirit taunts her about the nail marks around from people who withered away. She then goes back to the ghost stall. He greets her though, and he tells her his actual name, Shimoda. And he was the head of an old noble family, with his estate being here before Heavenly Host was even constructed. He then explains how corpses will age as if years have passed in hallways you just walked by, appearing out of nowhere. Shimoda also explains they may be in another closed space since they were separated. Then Nana asks about love out of nowhere. He explains about a woman named Aya and how she told him to leave her to go venture into a foreign country, in which they kept in touch with letters until she passed away from heart complications. He then found out as a spirit he is unable to move on from this place, from his declaration I guess. They then speak about the difference between like and love in the Japanese language. If I speak about FF7 I'm in trouble. Then he says another funny line. I like you. Then Nana continues her search for her friends. I like you. The next one we see more of Naho, Taguchi and Kibiki. And by more I mean one second as we get to see what Taguchi was experiencing in Heavenly Host. He's in a stairwell hiding alone in Heavenly Host looking for Kibiki. He ran and dropped the camera and then going back for it, someone removed the tape so he could record more, seems a bit sus. Taguchi then spots Naomi crying out for Seiko. He runs to meet Naomi but finds Sachiko herself possessing Naomi in the classroom, which obviously scares Taguchi. Sachiko turns around and looks at him before disappearing with Naomi. He then gets chased by Yuki but mysteriously blood appears on the wall that helps him. He then sees Seiko as we saw her last alive. He hides from her thinking she is possessed though. He sees Seiko entering the custodian's closet, but inside finds the boy ghost Ryu. Avoiding his gaze due to the blood message, he wonders where Seiko went and opens up the closet to find nothing. But there is something in the back. Going further, he finds the secret passageway. Following up further, he sees Yoshikazu coming down the ladder with Naomi's unconscious body. Sachiko is moving Naomi to play the trick on her that Seiko hanged herself. He runs away as Yoshikazu gives chase, but runs into a possessed Naomi covered in blood. He runs away screaming, then lies down in the stairwell, just wanting to die, but Naho's spirit appears, explaining the closed spaces. But also gives us some new lore, saying this particular closed space is much older than the one they entered in, possibly hundreds of years old. Then tells him she's dead, and she can't find Kabiki. But she's also able to sense life energies, and she thinks Kabiki is also dead. She does have some loyalty though, trying to find an escape for Taguchi, who just needed to play more Dead by Daylight to survive. Seeing the blood appear beside him, Naho tells him it's actually Kabiki who from beyond the grave has been helping him. I'm kinda sad this character didn't survive, I would have liked someone from a different school, even non-school character to survive. Kabiki even fixed the camera for him. He then gets back to recording and enters back into the girl's bathroom to see the infamous scene. We then get a scene that I don't remember from first time playing, where we finally see the plot hole of how Yoshiki survived. 
as Yoshikazu is about to hit him with the hammer in the same room that Yuka died in, one of the wrong endings, Yoshikazu instead just keeps hitting the ground in front of him, almost as if he's fighting the curse. Yoshikazu then runs away suddenly, then a random living boy appears, the one we saw playing the dating game in one of the extra chapters. He saves Yoshiki and then Yoshiki thanks him. He is humble about it though and says it was just good fortune. The boy actually caused a sound outside to create a distraction that helped save Yoshiki. Tomohiro says he reminds him of a classmate who bullied him, but Yoshiki doesn't understand what he meant and calls him the cock of the walk. I've never heard that expression. He then runs out since he heard a voice of one of his classmates. Yoshiki keeps telling him to keep his voice down though since Yoshikazu is still around. Surprisingly though, we hear Kurosaki, but I think it's obvious they are in a different close space. Apparently Tomohiro also left his friends to die when they were attacked and he feels like he's been punished. Then suddenly his dating game device starts powering on called Love Miracle Palpitation Revolution Plus. It seems a ghost is playing the game by itself. It turns out his friend Ryusuke was playing the game since he died. It's kind of nice that the dead characters seem to interact with their friends. We learn this dude's legs got completely cut off so that's a violent end. Yoshiki then comforts him saying if he's possessing the game console they can play together at any time. The child spirits then appear as actual flames, not spirits, which is weird. They aren't actually the Yuki group either, they're just random kids. But he takes out a figure from some kid's TV show and gives an excuse most adults give. That leads to a wrong end, so instead the game console goes flying out of his pocket under the ground by Ryosuke to distract the child spirits. Then they run out while they are focused on the game. Then Tomohiro says the worst advice to split up. They say they'll meet each other again, but they never do. Then Yoshikazu appears and knocks him out with the hammer again, then leaves him. Sachiko then finds Yoshikazu asking where he was, so it does seem Yoshikazu acts on his own sometimes and might be trying to help them. Yoshiki can't remember what happened though or the name of the person who saved him. We then see Tomohiro's experience after separating and he keeps on finding corpses everywhere, including one of his classmates, Emi. He then finds another female student from a completely different school. He learns from Yoshiki and acts tough to try and protect her, but unknown to him, Kizumi appears from behind him and stabs him. The blood from him landing on the female student who then runs away. Kizumi wanted him to beg, but Tomohiro doesn't and it confuses him. But Tomohiro doesn't and it confuses him. Tomohiro doesn't give him the satisfaction he wants. We actually found his corpse in the main story. On to the second last extra chapter now and it's another Yoshiki one. He wakes up feeling a lot of pain, but not knowing where Yumi is. He runs away from red spirits and is found to be constantly coughing. Ayumi is in the bathroom crying about Yoshiki then having a flashback, the same one we saw on a wrong end but now from her POV. He comes to the conclusion that he has opened up to her and she has now seen how much he did for her. The red spirits start taunting saying Ayumi is dead and hinting some poor souls go through the motions of life after they die. Which means it could have been fun to have Seiko or Mayu extra chapters, but they didn't. Then Yoshiki finally finds Ayumi but she can't see him or hear him. He then starts writing with chalk saying it's him, Yoshiki. And then he finally remembers. See this extra chapter is actually a continuation of the wrong end where Yoshiki was killed by the anatomical model burning him. Then we see Ayumi's POV of Yoshiki as a ghost but Yoshiki even in death proves to be the best character. We even get something interesting, his soul is now different than the others who died here. He promises to stick by her side. We then see all the pain he feels from being killed but Yoshiki toughs it out because he's a badass. So it was cool to see a glimpse into how spirits might act after death, though Yoshiki was a bit of a special case. And this brings us to the final extra chapter in the game, and this is a weird one. Because the game is set in 2008, but this chapter is set in 2021, and a brand new one to the port. So let's take a look. We play as a character called Miku, who is a live streamer, so yeah, already a different vibe. Her mother tells her that she has a checkup at Amar Patriarcha Circus Hospital, that's a name. And also there may be a new course party game coming out this year that's set in a cursed hospital, so that might be relevant. And I might have to be saying that name a lot. Miku only has 100 subs, which, you know, is a bit less than mine, but it could be a lot more less. And then we learned that the damn virus that quarantine people has mentioned, so that's part of horror game lore now. She's researching what to do on her stream next and finds an article about middle schoolers being missing across Japan, a charm blamed for it, and seven school students murdered, which obviously isn't matching up with the end of this game, so yes, this actually takes place after Blood Drive, a full three games ahead of this one. Fun timeline I've gotta explain here, but that's all you need to know right now. It being long ago, now the Heavenly Host knowledge is kinda known by people, sending victims into another dimension and erasing their existence. 
Concern over the charm banned anyone from performing it on school grounds as if that's gonna stop them. She then searches online and now in 2021 of course people know about and have researched it and tell people to search for the Heavenly Host incident. They also say some schoolgirls did the ritual and claim they saw the school for a second and then nothing happened. It doesn't send you there anymore. They then talk about a legendary survivor and describe him as a normal dude who got dogs so we can guess who a normal average dude is. Miku forgot to turn off her stream though and it's ending up on livestream fails. She brings a paper doll to do the charm with her friend but was also given stones outside her house saying, has she reached Nirvana yet? And she brought those stones and didn't question them. The charm now works but you have to close your eyes to see Heavenly Host but then when you open them you come back. I don't think she realizes the stream wouldn't be able to see anything but her closing her eyes though. Oh yeah, her friend is called Ryoka, but I'm not gonna lie, I've said so many names in this video and they all sound so similar. Miku's very much studied content creation, <laughs> a bit too much. They do the charm, but once doing it, the stream stops. We hear some text, but we don't know the voice it belongs to. She wakes up and we find out she has asthma, so we know who the voice belonged to. I guess that answers the question I just had. She explores around an even darker version of Heavenly Host's classroom. What's weird though is they didn't fall through a hole. They heard footsteps in the living world. And suddenly she hears footsteps outside of the Heavenly Host classroom. Hiding under a desk, someone tells her that if she wants to die and she knows they're a live streamer. I guess her live streaming her plans wasn't the best idea. She runs away, though she doesn't manage to get a look at the person. She explores round and finds Ryoka's student ID. She then finds her first corpse, which looks freshly dead. But weirdly, the note says another person who wanted to die. So it seems there's a serial killer like Victor Zaz, because like, all the death wasn't enough. She finds even more corpses and it looks like there's a whole other mystery going on now. She then finds Mayu's corpse and has a flashback. She then goes to the girl bathrooms and spots someone staring at her from inside. She goes in and finds them all dead inside, hanging. But they're new victims, not old corpses. The last doll has her name written and the age of death is 16. She hears a noise and goes into the stall to hide. And someone else is in here with her, the killer. But she manages to escape. She then enters the infirmary and finds Ryoka. As she's crying over her unconscious body, someone enters, a man in a lab coat with red eyes. Yeah, it's getting weird. He explains he performed background checks on her and how in her sadness found the dark side of the internet and learned about the school. Yeah, Coast Party's story is going off the rails into murder coats now. This person posted the instructions in the dark web and he kills them so it seems like the actual ghosts aren't here anymore. But the school is still here. He explains he is from 2021 and works for a certain organization which the jokes there just fight themselves. You can literally put anything there and it works. The man plays on her fears knowing a lot about her but as he's about to kill her, Satoshi comes in and fights him off. But Satoshi is the same age he was in the main game who is now known as the legendary survivor in Miku's time. They run away but the man doesn't follow and doesn't try attacking them, saying to them, Matuba's tomb will rise again as long as they have the stones. At this point you're probably confused since this is after Blood Drive, three games after this plot. So let's just say we'll be learning about Matuba's tomb in a future video and all that fun plotline stuff it has, during which Satoshi has already run away. He also lost the stones and Yoshi's spirit in the black mist appears and starts writing in the diary. He tries running away and gets stuck in which Yoshi then kills him. Ryoka actually wakes up not dead and Satoshi then meets up with them and Miku starts fangirling over him as a living legend. She then explains how she's from the future. This sounds so fanfic -y. And then he accepts it because why wouldn't you in the cursed school with ghosts and stuff and time being messed up. He does get really happy being called the survivor because he knows that he will make it back with his friends but also knows that anything they could do could also change the future. Then an earthquake happens and he gets sent to another close space. There's the possibility this even happened during one of the chapters in the main game and Satoshi just forgot when he woke up. Miku checks her video but Satoshi isn't in it and she's just speaking to herself. We then get the text, prepare for the next heavenly host, with a woman wearing a black hood saying she's a patient at that hospital. And that's it. That's the tease we get until maybe this year, but the series sure does get weird from this game on, let me tell you that. So with all the main story covered and all the extra chapters now done, it's time to get to the part of the video where I give my overall thoughts on the game. Corpse Party is truly one of the horror greats. I hope this video was able to recapture or introduce you to this franchise. The atmosphere of Corpse Party is incredible, from its sound design to its art to the creepy messages left from the dead. 
the sense of fear and despair for the characters has got to be one of the best horror games. It really shows just how scared the characters are in this game, which just increases the sense of terror. Each room has a story, each corpse has its own tale of how they died and what happened. The world design is masterful, but what really makes Corpse Party great is its storytelling and characters. There isn't too much in terms of jump scares here, it's more atmospheric horror in its story. The decisions you make that can have terrible consequences. The descriptive words of how gruesome the wrong ends are and can be. But what I like most about Cole's part is how flawed these characters are, except Yoshiki is perfect. But in terms of the flaw of other characters, they aren't super confident, they aren't super smart characters, they're just high schoolers. Flaws and all emotions that, that brings, and also sometimes caring more about crushes to distract themselves, making dumb mistakes or getting emotional or panicking. In situations, you want to root for these characters to survive. You see how much they suffer, so when you finally do get that semi-happy ending, it's so rewarding. The overall game's length is also perfect. It's long, but not too long, and there's a fun mystery of the Heavenly Host instant that you're working out through the game. And the twists and turns, they're all fun. I see sometimes people say, well, this character didn't do anything and was useless, but they're not meant to be top survivors. They're just high school students. A lot of the time, the character's more to develop a plot point than to stand out as a hero per se. I think that's fine. In this kind of game, Seiko is obviously a fan favourite, but Naomi is also a great written character as well. They all show the effects of darkening and how most people would react in these situations, though Yuko could really just stop pretending to be younger. With the context of these characters being scared high schoolers in the most nightmarish place, I think people can judge these characters a bit too harshly. In the end, Coast Party is a game that, like most great games, sticks with you after the credits end. Diving into the deepest, dark, parts of humanity, but also the hope and happiness that overcoming these dark paths can give. While the community isn't as strong as it was back when all the Let's Players were playing it, I'm sure the community can be strong again someday, especially with the brand new Corpse Party game coming out. Reliving Corpse Party was a nostalgia trip that wasn't disappointing and those are quite rare sometimes, so thank you so much for letting me entertain you for the long time this video is probably going to be. If you enjoyed it, I'd appreciate if you liked, commented, and shared this video if you think someone will enjoy this analysis immersive storytelling with jokes mixed in. And subscribe for more long form videos and games. This video is kind of my magnum opus. I've been working on this for years. Changing it, debating if I could even make a video on such a gruesome game, so I kind of had to wait a bit because the audience wasn't exactly fit for this kind of game. And my next video on pretty much a similar game to this is actually coming very soon, and I'm currently playing through Silent Hill 1, so. Let me tell you, if you did enjoy this kind of video, I would make sure to subscribe with notifications on because there's so much content coming to this channel really soon. Of course, while this may seem like the end of Corpse Party, it's just the beginning. We're going through this whole series and other series like Silent Hill and more, so I don't believe in the phrase, the fun has to end, and there's even a brand new Corpse Party game this year. So I'm excited to see the series continue. We are mostly going to be focusing on horror games here, but I'm also going to have a fair share of non-horror games, and I'll keep you updated on future plans and upcoming videos. And now onto the Patreons, and hey, we actually got one. So thank you so much to James, and I'm going to display his favorite character here, in which, unsurprisingly, is Pyramid Head. Somehow his last name's not Sunderland. But thank you again to James for pledging to the Patreon. And if you want more ways to support the channel from, you know, just subscribing, liking, commenting, whatever, you can check the Patreon below where I've got different tiers with different rewards. This was the hero and heroine, that's a hard word to say, in which you get vocal credit at the end and I will display your favorite character that you tell me. Which also has an audio only downloadable version of the video and I will also be making creators commentaries for the video starting from Silent Hill 2. And all videos therefore. I also have a Twitter where I talk about games I like, right now my obsession is FF7, so if you want to follow me there where I will talk about video games, also content creation stuff and probably annoy people with some of my video game takes. And fandom stuff. But once again, thank you for watching this entire video and now I want you to tell me your favorite Corpse Party character down below and why you like them because I'm interested if it's Yuka we're gonna have a long conversation. Next video is coming soon but check out these videos and playlists if you like this video and if you're new here I hope you stay and if you're a returning viewer you're here forever unlucky. Sarabada. I love you!